Astonishing Legends would like to thank Quip, The Great Courses Plus, StoryWorth, Best Fiends, our contributors at Patreon.com, and you, our listeners, for making tonight's show possible. On the 4th of July in 1909, Freeland Oscar Stanley opened a 48-room hotel in picturesque Estes Park, Colorado. Intended to be a resort and health retreat for wealthy individuals stricken with tuberculosis, it has mostly flourished for the last 110 years, expanding to 142 rooms and going from seasonal operation to a year-round destination. F.O. Stanley and his twin brother were wealthy men. They'd made their fortunes in developing significant improvements to the factory production of dry plates for photography. Realizing he was unable to compete, George Eastman, the founder of Eastman Kodak, bought the Stanley Dry Plate Company for a vast fortune. Following that, the Stanley twins opened the Stanley Motor Carriage Company, which you may not have heard of. Still, we'll wager that many of you have heard the expression Stanley Steamer. Even if you didn't realize, it was one of the very few steam-powered cars successfully developed in the early 1900s and at the time, the fastest vehicle on Earth with a top speed of 127 miles per hour, just 8 miles per hour slower than James Dean's Porsche, which wouldn't come along for 47 more years. The steamer held that top speed record for six years until the only thing that could beat it was a motorcycle with a V8 engine. Unfortunately, F.O. Stanley was eventually diagnosed with tuberculosis, a disease that seems to have been a running theme on Astonishing Legends in 2019. A coincidence, we assure you. Nevertheless, his doctor, like all doctors did back then, advised him to get to a location where he could get some fresh clean air in the Rocky Mountains and recover from the dreadful symptoms he had. His diagnosis had come at the age of 54, a late stage in life to be finding something as deadly as TB. Stanley had money, so he was able to have himself seen by the best tuberculosis doctor in the country. After spending a few cold months in Denver, Colorado, in a house just one block from Chessman Park, which is an old cemetery converted to a park that is now considerably haunted, Stanley opted to get out into the proper Rockies, and his doctor recommended Estes Park. According to Wikipedia, Stanley's doctor, Dr. Bonnie, compared the climate of Estes Park to Davos, Switzerland, which at the time was a very upscale resort for Europeans afflicted with tuberculosis. Although tuberculosis cannot be cured by fresh air, after staying in Estes Park for a summer, he made dramatic improvements. In fact, one may go so far as to say that eventually he was cured, although that would be impossible. Perhaps he was misdiagnosed initially. We'll likely never know. But in the end, his improved health only added to his enamor with the area, and he built a luxurious house there known as Rockside that still stands to this day and is now privately owned. In 1907, he began construction on the 48-room Stanley Hotel, which included a concert hall, where many of the events discussed tonight took place. It opened in 1909, drawing power from a hydro plant that Stanley also built, which was the first source of electricity for Estes Park. The town thrived. The Stanley and all of its outbuildings are on the National Historic Register, and it now boasts 142 rooms. Some of those rooms, like room 217, have a tendency to be occupied by something unseen, even when the front desk might be inclined to mark them vacant. In fact, it was a night in room 217 at the end of the season that inspired Stephen King to write one of his most famous tales, The Shining. But like all astonishing legends, that's only the beginning of this story. Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is Forrest Burgess. Any big hotels have got scandals, just like every big hotel has got a ghost. Why? Hell, people come and go. Stephen King, author of The Shining. Join us tonight as we take a trip to the Stanley Hotel with a gentleman who worked there for years, Connor J. Randall. Here's Johnny. Oh, okay, that's that's going to be one of those times 
what I'm not going to make you say, and we're back. Well done. That was pretty good. Well, thank you. I hope that's the last time I have to attempt a Jack Nicholson impression. You know, the funny thing is, a lot of people listening will only know it as a reference from the movie The Shining and not a reference to its origin, which is The Tonight Show, starring Johnny Carson. The Tonight Show? Never heard of it. <laughs> yeah, see? My point exactly. Well, folks, we've got a super fun show for you tonight, speaking of tonight, and we're excited to bring it to you. But first, we wanted to let everyone that ordered the glasses and hoodies from the Black Friday sale know that they're all starting to go out, so be on the lookout for that stuff. Wait, uh, all right, here we go. I got a line. I had to think of something Jack Nicholson actually says. In oh, the goody, you're going to do it. That, uh, yeah, I used to try to get you yeah. not to do impersonations, <laughs> but now I want them, so. Well, only because people were writing in telling you to lay off, man. Yeah. Let him, let him fly his freak impersonation flag. Fly it, man, fly it. Which I, I don't really often like to do. But here we go. Here's one great line I thought uh, Jack did very well. Perhaps you'll recognize where it's from. Never rub another man's rhubarb. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. I guess if oh, I... Was, what, come what, on. It's popular it now. It's, no, I don't know. No. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's Jack Nicholson is the Joker. Oh, that's the Joker. Okay. Never rub another man's rhubarb. Oh. Yeah, he says that after he shoots Michael... Uh, Michael Keaton. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Michael Tim Keaton. Burton's Batman. Michael yeah. Keaton's actually my favorite Batman. Yeah, he's one of the greats. I'll probably get in trouble for that, but... That's what I think. Uh, you're going to get letters, but uh, gonna get please letters. send them gonna to get letters. Scott. But we like yeah. letters. <laughs> Well, anyway, all right, well, enough of that silliness here. We also wanted to mention some supporting content that you might enjoy in conjunction with tonight's show from friends of ours in the paranormal world. Firstly, we highly recommend the second season of Hellier, which you can find on Amazon Prime if you have it. Be sure to watch season one. I think it's on there as well. So watch it in order because it's an evolution, man. It's an extremely fascinating trip down a long, strange paranormal road, and tonight's guest, Connor J. Randall is prominent in it. I mean, he's one of the main team members here, along with his best friend, the director, editor, and cinematographer for it, Carl Pfeiffer. Yes, and of course, Greg and Dana Newkirk from Week and Weird. If you haven't seen it, check it out because we're only touching on the primary story in it. But if you get familiar with that story, you'll have a greater understanding of how Connor and Carl's experiences at the Stanley Hotel in the preceding years culminated in their involvement with the Newkirks for Hellier and took a new paranormal investigation method they pioneered into the mainstream. You'll also hear us talk tonight about a series called Spirits of the Stanley, and we'll be explaining where you can find that as well later on. And that one is critical in understanding the development of the Estes Method, which is a little bit more for next week's episode of the show, but we wanted to just give you guys all the backstory so you could do your research just like we do. Yeah, and if you want to sit the Wayback Machine even a little further... Our good friend and former guest of the show, Jim Perry, who produces the Euphemet podcast, has just re-released his episode with Greg Newkirk that originally ran in March of 2016, and it details what instigated the entire Hellier investigation. That episode has been available only to Euphemet patrons for a while now, but Jim has just dropped it back into his main feed, and it's now titled... Hellier was just a symptom. So look for Euphomet, that's E-U-P-H-O-M-E-T, and that episode wherever you get your podcasts. Hearing that will help you wrap your head around the entire big picture here. And finally, a reminder that we've managed to pseudo-assemble our long-lost mess of a holiday special, and we'll be dropping that as a commercial-free gift to our listeners late in the day on December 23rd, 2019. <laughs> Gift? That's actually more like a lump of coal in your stocking. <laughs> I happen to think that they're going to enjoy it. No, oh, maybe, maybe so. But tonight, let's talk about the Stanley Hotel. Back when we watched the first season of Hellier, and, you know, all those guys were in it, didn't really know them, sort of knew Greg and Dana from Twitter and stuff like mm -hmm. that, but, you know, haven't actually haven't ever met them in person, not even spoken to them, I don't think. We've talked no. a lot on Twitter and stuff like that. Yes. But in that scene in Hellier in season one, when they're all on that porch doing the Estes method, uh -huh. I mean, there's a lot of scenes where they're practicing it. And that's when I was just like, wait, who is this guy talking about Connor? I, I was yeah. like, I want to talk to this guy about what he's, he just seems so measured and precise yeah. about that process. And it made me feel good because, you know, we're kind of snobs about the techniques and, you know, maintaining. <laughs> you know, hey, don't include me in that. No, well, <laughs> I guess, I mean, just, you know, maintaining yeah. or, or tamp down your confirmation bias as much as you can. No, and absolutely. And that sort yes. of thing. And make sure that you're actually experiencing something and not just letting your wanting to experience something influence what's happening. Right. And that's tricky in this line of work because 
I believe, at least at this point, you're never, yeah. I don't care what you do. I don't care if Doc Brown comes back from the future and helps you out. You're never going to get uh -huh. <laughs> precise lockdown evidence that you've managed to communicate with something from the other side or right, prove what right. it was. And that's the thing I think that bothers the skeptical minds. Mm -hmm. They don't like that there's not a way to categorically prove that what you're doing is what you think is happening. They don't like that. Yeah. And for me, no. I think you have to get past seeking that and just move into different ways to enhance what's going on and use the culmination of all of that to figure out if what you think is happening is really happening. Right. Well, there's a couple of thoughts. We've certainly gone over this before. And one quote goes back to actually our PGF coverage when I believe it was one of the Russian scientists. He said, no scientist will ever be satisfied with indirect evidence. That meaning footprints, photographs, measurements, all that kind of stuff, even though that's how we measure and accept a lot of our theories about space. Because you can't actually travel to a black hole. You can't put your finger on it. You get sucked in. But that's what we know from just looking at it. But when it comes to Bigfoot, what he said was, none of you will be satisfied until we have a Bigfoot standing in your office and you can poke him and make him mad. Right. So none of that indirect evidence will ever satisfy anybody. And as far as the spiritual world goes, I still maintain we're not supposed to get solid direct evidence. And that's the, like you just said it, what science wants and what a lot of skeptics, you know, mostly debunkers. I, I think there are maybe a lot of people who are agnostic, meaning they haven't had an experience. They don't know anything about it. And they will err on the side of caution as far as believing this kind of stuff until they experience it themselves. And some, even if they have one, they'll still keep denying it. But what you have then is science saying, well, this phenomenon doesn't exist because it's not completely repeatable every time. Right, in a controlled way. Yeah, exactly, or even repeatable under controlled circumstances to a satisfactory amount of time. It does not play with you that way. And that's one thing I think that comes through in our episode tonight is that you get some interaction, but it's not exactly the way you thought, but it's significant enough and in context enough for me to be significant and that it does not seem random to me. Well, yes. And I think the other really important factor here that's really interesting, and I don't recall us ever talking to anybody that was in this position. I'm sure people are out there. I mean, there's plenty of people out there that have studied the same phenomenon their whole lives. And as mm -hmm. a result, they have this culmination of experience. And this hasn't been his whole life, but a good portion of Connor's life was spent at the Stanley doing the same investigation over and over in the same circumstances. So he was able to remove the uncertainty of the environment or the situation, knowing where there were things that could enhance the kinds of interactions that he was having with right. what he later concluded to be these spirits, and actually even learning the names of some of them, as you'll hear tonight yeah. in some of the EVPs that he provided us, which are really compelling. And what you'll find is that his ability to be there and do the same things over and over led him to actually getting to where he was on a first name basis with some of these spirits. And you'll hear that clearly in some of the EVPs that he shared with us to share with you tonight. Yeah. And there's one aspect that we didn't really get to talk about too much with Connor. I, I wanted to ask him more about it. We did skirt around the edges a little bit, but really ask him about his feelings about the relationship to these spirits and entities. Because over time, that's what it seemed like was happening to me and that you, it's like with anybody. And I think that's something that if you ever go on a ghost hunt and you've got some equipment, that's certainly one thing that I have been trying to learn and remember myself is when you go to a haunted place or a location that has activity and you want to get some interaction, you have to remember if these are spirits of deceased people, they're people. <laughs> It's like going to any other place and meeting anybody else and wanting to talk to somebody that you're not that familiar with. You have to be polite. You have to ask the right questions. You have to engage them in the right way. Because as I've said this before, you go and try and meet strangers and you act weirdly, or you just stick a recorder in their face and ask them a bunch of questions. A lot of people aren't going to want to talk to you. So it is developing that relationship and a bit of a friendship and familiarity. And I think that's why they got such good results over that long period of time. Well, I couldn't agree more. On that note, let's go to our interview with Connor Randall. Okay, so as we said, we were very much interested in covering the Stanley Hotel and have been for a while. A lot of our listeners have been requesting it from us for years. And 
it kept getting onto the back burner, but now it's come to the front burner, and we figured it would be a fun show to do, especially towards the end of the year in the wintertime for everybody. And the first thought that we had when we wanted to do that was to reach out to somebody that we knew had a lot of experience at the Stanley, which is Connor J. Randall, who we're going to have on the show tonight. And then we also wanted to talk to him about the Estes Method. And if you haven't heard about this, it is pretty mind-blowing. We are huge fans of how this developed, and we want to hear about that as well. So that's going to be a little bit more part two of this series. But we just wanted to thank you so much for taking the time and coming on the show tonight. Thank you so much for having me as a... uh listener as well. It's really cool to be talking with you guys. Well, I'm the one that's kind of starstruck, honestly, because I've watched all of Hellier 1. Obviously, I've watched a good portion of Hellier 2, and I've also seen the videos that you recommended, Spirits of the Stanley, which was just amazing. We're going to get to that in a little bit, but I'm uh, legitimately a a little starstruck having you on and and hearing (laughs) your voice even, because, of course, this week I watched hours and hours of you talking back to back, so (laughs) that's part of it. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Well, thanks for doing um, that. We're trying. Yeah, no, it's really fascinating stuff. But before we get into all that, let's talk a little bit about who you are and your background before we get to the Stanley Hotel. Maybe you could tell our listeners a little bit about where you grew up and what led you to the Stanley Hotel in the first place. Also, I think it's really fascinating what your day job is. I thought we might talk about that a little bit as well. Sure. You know, my story begins, I've born and raised here in Colorado at the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. I always looked at the Stanley Hotel as an interesting destination. I had interests in paranormal phenomena from a very early age. It was confirmed through a happenstance at the Stanley Hotel. And and a lot of people don't know this, or, or I don't talk necessarily too much about it. But I am actually a heart transplant recipient. So oh my gosh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so wow, I had a big things medically that I had to deal with as a young child. Um, And that's not discussed in in Hellier or the other shows that I do because I don't want to be heart transplant guy. You know, it's just something that was a part of my past and I'm better now and it's wonderful. But when I was a little boy, there was an event that was a fundraiser for the local children's hospital. And they wanted me to go up and basically, you know, sort of take a check and like be like, hey, I'm here. I'm one of the little ambassador kids from Children's Hospital. I was probably eight, nine years old. I remember standing in the lobby of the main concert hall of the Stanley Hotel and watching a door lock by itself, just whoop, latch right over without anybody else on the other side. And as a little boy, that just completely perplexed me. I got interested wow. in the show Ghost Hunters when it came out when I was about 12 years old. And then I just kept diving further and further and joined up with the local team, did that whole thing. And when I was a teenager up into college, and then when I was in college, I I landed the job as the resident paranormal investigator at the Stanley Hotel. And how old were you when that happened? I started working at the Stanley when I was just 17. I was the concierge uh, slash history tour guide. And that's just because I wanted to be where the ghost stories were. And so I went up there and got that job. They found out about my interest in ghosts. And then they started doing a little paranormal program on the side um, in the nighttime. And I joined up with those guys. And essentially, when I was 19 years old, I became uh, one of the resident paranormal expert people, quote unquote, writing out the history and the, and the paranormal stories and keeping track of guest logs and worked there for five whole years. This is an amazing story. And you know what's interesting is in that series that you did, again, that we're going to touch on tonight in uh, Spirits of the Stanley, you mentioned being there as a child and you mentioned the hospital, but you didn't say why or what. You didn't go into any depth on it. So it was something I actually wanted to ask you about. (laughs) So that's really fascinating. When you came back to apply for the job, did you relay that initial experience with the door lock to them? You know, it's funny. I did not. I, uh, Uh I was talking with the history guy and I just wanted to act excited about the history when really I had a secret, secret mission that I (laughs) only wanted to know about the ghosts. (laughs) Oh my God. That's amazing. So that you were the concierge. Now, how big is the Stanley for people who've never been there? Because everyone has this perception of it from the movie as being just monumentally huge. What is it actually like? It is a, it's a large hotel. It has a couple of conference rooms that were old music rooms and it has its entire concert hall, this entire big building that's modeled after where the Boston Symphony Orchestra performs, but it's about a third of the size on the property. 
all told, about 120 rooms. It's a large hotel, but it's not like the beasts that are built in this modern day. So, Connor, you're saying that the hotel management officially wanted to start doing paranormal investigations on site. They did. Yeah, they initially did. You know, what's funny is they started out very slow into it, where what I would do is I would do just a little 45-minute tour in the evenings telling some ghost stories of the outbuildings. And then they suddenly were like, well, maybe we can do a nighttime tour. Oh, well, people seem to like paranormal investigation. And when ghost hunters came here, that was a pretty big deal for the hotel. Why don't we do full-on paranormal investigation people? And so I was actually a hotel staffer with the job title of resident paranormal investigator. <laughs> that is very rare. You you'd never hear about that. It's true. Either a hotel or any other kind of public property that's renting it out either tries to shy away from that kind of history, or they do have tours, but rarely do they assign somebody that specific job, it seems. So you're kind of lucky in that regard. Oh, absolutely. And it's lucky in two ways. Number one, because I was one of the few individuals who was actually able to not make a lot of money, but make some money doing doing paranormal investigations. A lot of that, of course, comes from just teaching the public a lot of how to do this and that. We would take groups of 10 to 20 people three nights a week, you know, and, and so it was a lot. But the thing is, is how often do people actually get to return to the same location over and over and over again, purely to look for the ghosts? It's a pretty rare opportunity. We're talking I mean, what, over a thousand times, over a thousand nights I spent there, specifically trying to talk with the ghosts. Yeah, that's amazing. That definitely makes you the expert. I want to get into that a little bit more. But before we do that, I want to double back just a little bit. You're not currently a full-time paranormal investigator, right? You have a day job. That's right. Yeah, I do have a day job, a day job that I specifically have sort of designed <laughs> so that I can still do what I love. I work as a reading clerk at the Colorado House of Representatives. Now, in Colorado, because I'm, I got my degree in politics and economics, the legislative branch only meets for five months out of the year. And so for those five months of the year, I basically live at the state capitol and I'm in charge of reading the bills aloud, of going through and proofing little bill history things and, and stuff like that. And then once it hits May, so that's January to May, once it hits May, I, I'm scot-free to uh, go out and live my life hunting for ghosts and monsters. So that's, that's the five-year plan. Why do you read the bills aloud? Like what part of the process is that? Why is that important? What's funny is that it's actually an old piece of statute where back in the 1800s, not everybody who was elected could read. And so there was somebody oh. whose job it was to read the bills aloud. Now we just do it purely as a formality. My actual important job is counting the votes. So if you watch somebody on C-SPAN going through and saying representative so-and-so, and the person is out there and they're saying I or nay, and then they count the vote like that, that's essentially what I do for the state of Colorado. Wow. Do you get to wear a powdered wig or? <laughs> I wish. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Not when it's hot out, I'm sure. So one question, Connor, I wanted to ask you has to do with watching Spirits of the Stanley and your current day job in that you guys were experimenting with the Estes method. And we're going to get to that a little bit later here because it's fascinating, as Scott said. But basically, you're getting responses from a... SB7 ghost box, or it's that tuned radio that will skip around and find frequencies. And one of the responses that came through, and I think it was directed to you, was the word political. And I think Carl says like, wow, does, is whoever's talking to us, do they think Connor's being too political? And so it didn't have any reference then, but now it does. Absolutely. Yeah, that's uh, a day job and an interest. But you know, it's it's. I think that there's a lot of crossover between the legality of my day job and looking at details and transcripts and also uh, trying to apply a bit of that skill set over to investigations as much as I can. Well, it's pretty amazing. I think it's really cool. You said you'd kind of designed that job. Does that mean that they tailored it for you or how, how did that work? <laughs> no, I, I chose the job because I knew it was only for five months of the year. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's, that's nice. great. That's but nice. my bigger question here that you probably can't answer, do you think whoever was trying to communicate with you at the Stanley during that session was it a premonition thing of, of you getting a job in politics because you weren't working in politics at that time, were you? No, I was not. 
it's possible. I mean, I was in college getting a degree thinking that oh, that's, that's right. the direction that it would head. But the difficulty is that that's the direction that I thought. And then, of course, in the end, the paranormal, the ghosts, the aliens, the Hellier case <laughs> just right. kind of took over everything else which I'm happy it did. That's pretty fascinating. And I love that when you told me that, I was so shocked. I mean, do any of the people that you work with know about your your pastime during the other seven months of the year there? They do. And I, I'm sure they're a little bit frightened by me, I think, sometimes, some people. <laughs> it's And, and you know, we uh, everybody's pretty open-minded about it. I love sitting to talk with a state senator or representative or another employee or lawyer down there who you think is just lost in this this world sort of this one track mind and then you tell them what else you do and of course like as you guys know you hear their craziest experience which is a joy yeah that it is pretty amazing how people can't think of anything and then when you start talking about the other stories you've heard or something that's happened to you everybody comes up with something that they had forgotten about i want to go back to the hotel now because i, I first of all i wanted to ask you have you ever seen the movie the grand budapest hotel yes so you know the importance of being a concierge. Because <laughs> the first thing I thought when you said you were 17 years old, you were the concierge at the Stanley, I was yeah. like, this is Zero Mustafa right here. This yeah. is he's, he's <laughs> that character. And the importance and obsession of Scott working in the Grand Oh, Budapest yeah, I love Hotel that movie. I bring it up in all every the time. episode. Yeah. yeah. I, I just want to know, were you discreet? <laughs> you, you know, yeah, sure. <laughs> I can't imagine there was a lot of strange stuff going on there. Not as much. Everybody kind of comes there is a little strange anyways, I think, sometimes. <laughs> what do you do during the day when you come there? I mean, do you go skiing or what do you do to entertain yourself when you're a guest at the hotel? You know, Estes is not a ski town, uh -huh. which means that uh, it is quiet in the wintertime. The hotel was seasonal up until 1989. And so it was only open during the nicer months of the year. It gets very quiet the rest of the year. Most of the local shops in town close down. The hotel's main draw is that it's directly next to Rocky Mountain National Park, which is kind of the crown jewel of the Colorado Rockies. So that's where most of its thoroughfare is from. Do you know what's the one single discovery that matters the most for your dental care? Is it brushing on an irregular and unpredictable schedule so it keeps your teeth guessing when their next cleaning will be? You know, to maintain that element of surprise? Uh, no. Is it brushing quite violently and vigorously so you can get it done faster? No. Is it buying one of those really expensive electric toothbrushes, the ones you have to charge up with a base that clutters your bathroom, and then you have to spend a lot to order replacement brush heads? No. All right, what is that one single discovery that matters most for good oral? health. Well, as the makers of the Quip electric toothbrush say, the one single discovery that matters most for your dental care is simply this, that if you have good habits, you are good. And Quip is one of the best, most affordable, and easy-to-use solutions for maintaining great dental care habits. Of course, because the Quip toothbrush is designed to get you most of the way towards that goal, and they make it so easy. Quip's electric brush has sensitive sonic vibrations with a built-in timer and 30-second pulses to guide a full and even clean for the dentist-recommended two minutes, twice a day. Use it with their anti-cavity toothpaste and floss regularly with their refillable floss, and bam, you are on your way to a great healthy habit. And here's what we mean by Quip making and maintaining that habit so simple and easy. Their refillable floss dispenser comes with pre-marked string to help you use just enough. Plus, Quip delivers fresh brush heads, floss, and toothpaste refills to your door every three months with free shipping. So your routine is always right. Join over 3 million healthy mouths and get Quip today, starting at just $25. And if you go to getquip.com slash legends, right now you'll get your first refill free. That's your first refill free at getquip.com slash legends. Spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash legends. Quip, the good habits company. Hello everyone, I'm Bronwyn, and this is Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. So let's get down to that experience. What I'd like to do, can you tell our listeners a little bit about the history of the hotel itself? Because it seems like you're the man that knows. The Stanley Hotel has a really interesting past and honestly, a really nice story to it. It was founded and created by a man named F.O. Stanley, the letters F.O. His name was Freeland Oscar Stanley. He was an inventor along with his identical twin brother, Francis Edgar Stanley. 
FO and FE created the Stanley Steam Car, which is what they're most well known for. But they actually made most of their money from their creation of the photographic dry plate, which was essentially a way for pictures to process a lot faster back in the late 1800s. They sold the patent to their device over to a man named George Eastman for a lot of money, and he went on to found Kodak. And so they're independently wealthy inventors. They really also enjoyed creating violins. They enjoyed music and the arts and a really interesting pair. One day when he was in his 40s, F.O. Stanley woke up and he started coughing up blood. He was diagnosed with tuberculosis, this being the late 1800s. And so he went to his doctor. His doctor told him the best thing would probably be to get out in nice, clean air. And his doctor had a hunting cabin, um, is the understanding, in the Estes Park area. So F.O. and his wife, Flora, went up to this cabin and stayed there for a couple of months. At the end of it, apparently, F.O. was wandering around, running around, just healed. We don't know if it was a misdiagnosis or what, but the point is, is F.O. Stanley had seen Estes Park and fell in love with it. Loved it so much, he built a home there. And that home is actually still standing. If you're in Estes Park, you can see it. It has the same color scheme as the Stanley Hotel. They go up there and spend a couple of years there. And his wife, Flora, would like to have a place to entertain guests. And the mythology is that F.O. Stanley basically said, I can do better than that. Let's build one heck of a guest house and created the Stanley Hotel. Wow, that's amazing. And I didn't realize until we started getting into this that it's due west of Loveland, right? Yeah, yeah. Which I went to as a kid. I actually lived in Denver from the time I was two until I was nine years old, and my father still lives there, so I'm there regularly. But I've never been to Estes Park, and I'm I am really, really want to go, actually, at this point. So I'm, I was hoping that maybe Forrest and I could make an excursion there. But unfortunately, I haven't been to Denver in about eight months, So, but next time I think I'm going to definitely put it on the plate. Yeah, shoot me a text. I'll probably go with you. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> and then we're going to check out Chesman Park and scare the crap out of Scott oh, yeah. during the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My dad doesn't live too far from that. And you're right, you're outside right. of Denver as well, right? Right, Okay. directly outside. How long does it take you to get to Estes Park from where you live? It's a good, it's just over an hour. Okay. It's about an hour and five minutes. Yeah. Not that bad, though. Not that bad, but enough to make it a bit of a, a very pretty drive. Right, right. So... That history is interesting. How long were they in possession of it or were they operating it? The Stanley Hotel opened in 1909. The construction took place from 1907 to 1909. They had it in operation for the rest of their lives. They did not have any children, but they both passed away in their old age in the early 1940s. And so after that, it went through a string of ownership and a whole lot of ups and downs throughout the years. And at one point it had fallen into disrepair, right? Right, yes. Especially in the 1970s, it had fallen into a pretty significant state of uh, sort of a dilapidated disrepair. Was not foreclosed, but it was not doing well. So it was open, but just not very well taken care of. Right, especially the outbuildings, like the concert hall, like some of the areas that I got to be very familiar with. I want to get onto that, but before we do, we have to ask the obvious question. How did Stephen King wind up there, and how did the hotel get connected to the germination for The Shining? It's the understanding that Stephen King was, he was doing a sort of a a short teaching span at CU Boulder, which is near Estes Park. He decided one day to take his wife for a weekend getaway up to Grand Lake, which is up near the National Park. Went up there and not being from Colorado, didn't realize that that road is closed because of snow for the winter months of the year. He had to turn back around, and as it's turning dark, they decide to turn in for the night at this hotel that is sitting there up on the side of the hill, very gigantic. They go to the hotel, they walk in and ask for a room. It turns out that they were there on the very last day that the hotel was to be open for the season. And so he and his wife were the only guests at the Stanley Hotel that night, were given naturally the nicest room in the place, room 217, and stayed up there. The legend is that Stephen King in that room 217 had a dream of his son being chased by the fire hoses 
throughout the halls of the Stanley Hotel. And then he woke up from that nightmare, sat outside on the balcony outside his room, smoking a cigarette. And he said by the time he was done with the cigarette, he had the whole plot for The Shining worked out in his mind. When you read the book, it's crystal clear that he's talking about the Stanley Hotel. The descriptors are, are spot on. Of course, the movie adaptation, which is even more popular, isn't exactly the case. Right. Kubrick took a lot of license with that, which is interesting because then King came along and remade it later with his own vision. But then people were so in love with the Kubrick version, it didn't get as much attention. Right. But that's interesting. So do you think that nightmare part, is that apocryphal or has he actually said that in interviews? Do you know? It's my understanding that he has said it in interviews, but that's also what I was told when I joined the hotel. Right, right. So, Connor, not to jump the gun here, but as concierge linking to Stephen King's experience, did a lot of guests have ghost stories or encounters to tell you about while you worked there? Is there anything to this? That's kind of a little bit where we're trying to head with this story, is that are there any stories that are real, and what's the history of the place in respect to paranormal stories? It's a fascinating question. I think the big hard answer that I have from all of my experience is that yes, the hotel is absolutely haunted, but it's not haunted in the way that pop culture thinks that it is. What we're dealing with at the Stanley is a myriad of different types of ghosts, you could say. There were a couple of main characters that I absolutely noticed more than others, but there's no old lady in the bathtub There's no ghosts that are out there to get you and trap you in the hotel. Some of the stories, specifically as concierge, that interested me more than any other one were the stories of people who would come up to me, not knowing my huge interest, and saying things like, hey, this happened in my room, thinking that it's a mechanical issue, or that somebody went into their room and opened up all the drawers, or that something like that happened, and it's just not even entering their mind that this is a possible paranormal occurrence, that some of those incidences were fairly common. Wow. So people would be coming and saying, hey, did someone go in the room and open all the drawers? I mean, things like that happened. I had one Of course, this said, you know, playing devil's advocate on myself here, I don't know if these people were trying to put me on, but I was never under the impression that that was the case. One of the best instances that I remember was this gentleman came downstairs. The Stanley Hotel also hosts business conferences. This guy came downstairs, talked to me and said, hey, I don't know if housekeeping messed up something in my room or what's going on. And so I asked him what was happening. He said, well, I came downstairs for the morning meetings, and then I went back upstairs, and I had left my suitcases open with some of my clothes laying out, and now all of my suitcases are closed, stacked on top of each other in front of the door to the room. And I said, what room are you staying in, sir? And he said, I'm up in 217. (laughs) And so I go up, and sure enough... Trying to open this man's door with him, suitcases are stacked up against the door and nobody is in the room. How somebody would have pulled that off, I'm not sure, but that was an experience that I had. Wow. Well, I guess it leads to this question. And again, I apologize for jumping the gun here, but I, it's asked of every guest. What are some of the more significant things that happened to you in this phase while you're just working there at a young age as the concierge? I would say probably the most significantly noticed portion of activity was people hearing children. The children ghosts were mainly up on the fourth floor. The way that the hotel worked way back in the day was on the second and third floors, single women and the couples, married couples would stay. On the fourth floor, the children and their nannies would stay. The single men had their own bachelor house, this whole other separate building called the manor house. Up on the fourth floor, people would hear children running up and down that hallway. I talked to some of the front desk staff. I heard this myself. I always tried while I was there to log the different incidences. I would say an average would probably be five or six times a month. People would call down in the middle of the night complaining that there are children outside of their rooms and they're not there. That's probably the most significant one that stands out to me from a staffing perspective. The interesting thing about the fourth floor is that there's one particular hallway that is the children's wing. That's where they would stay back in the day, one big, long hallway. 
And then on the other half of the fourth floor was where all the nannies would stay. This is separated exactly in half by what was the nanny's lounge, which is room 401, which is probably the most famous haunted room other than room 217. Everything that's on one side of 401 is where the nannies would stay. People would complain about hearing high-heeled shoes walking back and forth in the rooms that the nannies used to be in. I had one of my most startling experiences in one of those rooms. We had a door to the bathroom slam shut harder than I've ever seen a door shut in my life. There was some potentially residual stuff, but some potentially scary stuff on the fourth floor too. So that's interesting. And it seems like there was enough ongoing events that it just was part of being there. And this is something that I've picked up on from the Hellier series, as well as your series, Spirits of the Stanley. Just You get to a point where you stop trying to prove that something is happening or getting proof for yourself or for other people. And you're more just trying to figure out how to interpret what's happening. You get past that moment of like, this is gay, you know, this could be anything or whatever and going on to the interpretation, which I think it seems like in a way, when people get to that phase, to me, that's an indication that you're in a real environment where things are going on, that you've gone past the old creaky house or the old creaky building and those loud pipes and that sort of thing. And you've gotten into the next realm of stuff. So moving forward a little bit, I wanted to talk a little bit about the series that you recommended to us, the YouTube series that you did that Forrest and I both thought was amazing. I just found it so compelling. And this was something that you had produced with your friend Carl Pfeiffer. Right. Can you tell us a little bit for people that don't know or haven't seen Hellier, can you tell our listeners a little bit about Carl and how you guys met and how that mini series came to pass? Carl Pfeiffer is one of my best friends in the world. He's a Colorado born and raised kid as well. He actually, some people might recognize him from a show 10 years ago called Ghost Hunters Academy. He was the winner of the first season of that show. <laughs> Wait, great. how do you win a how do you win a show like that? What do you win? <laughs> so random? It was one of the spin-offs they did in Ghost Hunters back in the day. And so he he was on that show. And then when all of that with ghost hunters and all that stuff just kind of sort of to fade out for him, he started to work at the Stanley because he's passionate about it. And so he and I became partners in in our work and we worked together along with, there was a woman named Callie for a moment who was up there. There was a woman named Lisa who did investigations as well. And then Michelle Tate also came up and did investigations. And so Carl, myself and Michelle for about a year Basically, we're up there at the hotel thinking, we have a lot of interesting stories to tell. Maybe we should do a podcast or something. And then Carl started to get into video camera work just as a hobby, photography. And we started to put together our own little series of what it was like being a ghost hunter at the Stanley Hotel full time. And so you guys were just kind of doing that for fun, something you were interested in, you were passionate about, and you had the skill set to just get something on tape. So that's when you started documenting the investigations that you were going through at the hotel. Right. So we were already documenting it, but really just in our own little log books. That was part of the beauty of it, is that we were able to have this unique circumstance where we were in the same place over and over and over again, seeing when activity would happen, when it would not, and trying to map things out. What was the moon cycle? What was the weather? What was the wind outside? What was the group like? You know, and trying to notice these patterns really out of our passion for the field. Yeah. Okay. So that brings us to that series, Spirits of the Stanley, which our listeners can find on the Dark Zone Network YouTube channel, which we have a link to it in the show notes for this episode. So, and I, again, highly recommend it. One of my big takeaways from it Connor, was how intertwined you were with the hotel and with these characters from the other side, which the further it went, I mean, I was just on the edge of my seat, really, especially when it got down towards the end. And the other thing that's truly amazing about it, and it's almost an accidental serendipitous thing, is that you actually captured the development of the Estes Method in this footage, which is amazing. And again, for people who don't know what the Estes Method is, we're going to be going into depth on that in part two of this series. Those of you that have seen Hellier season one or season two will be familiar with it. But it's something that you guys organically developed 
that you found it started working and then you started experimenting with ways to make it work better and testing the limits of it. And all of that is caught on tape in that series, which is pretty amazing. Could you explain a little bit about what it is and how it works? And I know that people have heard this from Hellier season one, but just a a basic rundown, Connor, if you would, about just what it is exactly. The Estes method is essentially a combination of different devices and pieces being added into one method for spirit communication. It's named after Estes Park, which is where the Stanley Hotel is, because that's where we created it, as we saw in the series. Essentially, what we're doing with the Estes method is we're taking a SB7 spirit box, which is the bane of every Ghost Adventures hater's uh, <laughs> life. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This device that scans through radio frequencies very quickly. And we had that. What we decided to do was to, instead of listening out loud on a speaker, to plug one person in to big old noise canceling headphones, actual drummer's headphones that are just totally killed 25 decibels of sound around you. You can't hear anything else except for that feed. And then we blindfold that person as well. So combined with a spirit box, a blindfold, and soundproof headphones, you have this person who's completely inundated with the sound. And you sit back and you just report every single little word that you're hearing. And you sort of become a megaphone for the sounds that you hear coming across that device. One thing quickly, if you could explain this and clear this up, because one thing that I was first confused about when I heard about these spirit box years ago was, as you just explained, it's like an AM or FM radio that is programmed in different frequency rates that you can change yourself as the user to skip through all the channels on a dial, either AM or FM. But here's what I was confused about. Is it actually picking up bits of spoken word radio transmissions, or are the spirits, quote unquote, themselves forming words from the static it's getting? Where are these words coming from? Well, that's the real question. The odd thing is that you would absolutely expect, and you do hear small bits of radio stations coming across. I particularly enjoyed it in Estes Park because it was in the middle of the mountains where there's not much radio interference. Now, so you're hearing this uh, 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 every now and then, but there are times when you hear complete words and sentences across this device. My actual theory for how it works, and we'll go more in depth, this is just a little tease, is that I think it's possible that what we're doing is we're actually sort of giving this psychical ability to people who are hearing things and expecting to hear things, and then the spirit, how it works, I don't know, is able to input that message into the listener's ears for what they want to say because they're expecting to hear radio DJs, but instead you're going to have that sort of link potential. So it's the putty. You're giving it the clay to form something to send the message. We're giving it the clay to form words. If somebody was just listening to white noise, they're not expecting to hear words. Right. If you're listening to a spirit box, you're expecting to hear bits of words. Have you experimented with a white noise generator or other things? And did you have more or less results? You just find the SB7 is your best choice there or... We've done white noise and had a difficult time with it. We tried all sorts of variations. One of the other things that we try in Hellier Season 2 is we do it quite often with a Frank's box. Right. So that's another thing. Right. Okay. All right. We are going to come back around on that. I'd like to dial it back to the series again that you did because I was particularly caught up in the interactions that you had with three very particular spirits. And that's what you highlighted there. Now, I don't know. Obviously, we're only seeing what's edited and finished. Maybe there was a whole additional cadre of beings that you were interacting with. But primarily, we were talking about Paul, Lucy, and Eddie, right? Right. That's the main cast. That's the main cast. And so these are the main players for you. At what stage in your life at the Stanley did these three evolve into beings that you were able to interact with? How did you learn their names and who they were and that sort of thing? And I imagine each one has a different story. Uh, To me, Paul strikes me as the one you can nail down because that's associated with a former employee, right? Right. They each have a very interesting story. Two of them are very easy to explain. One of them is a paranormal conundrum. So we'll save that one for last. Okay. The two that have a solid background are Lucy and Paul. 
Paul was a security guard slash maintenance guy, worked there in the 1990s. And apparently he was outside shoveling snow one day when he had a heart attack and unfortunately passed away on his way to the hospital. Paul is interesting because he was a story that I was told as sort of a fabled legend when I started to work at the hotel. And then I started to notice bits of activity that could be attributed to him independently. You would hear boots walking back and forth on floors sometimes when you were alone in a building, hear the jingle of keys. He was the spirit who we most often attributed to people getting really scared of something or saying, you know, you need to get out, you need to leave. Because when people would tell these stories, it's like, oh, well, you were in a, in a room that you weren't supposed to be in in the middle of the night. Paul was doing his job keeping people in check. Oh, nice. You know, it's funny, though, I didn't have out of all of those three, Paul was the one that we had the least interaction with. You could say maybe that's because he's not as prevalent a spirit. Maybe it's because we were employees of the hotel. So we knew we could be where we wanted to. Right. A question that I had for later, but I might as well, I think I'll just ask it now is, did you ever see pictures of him or ever try to visit his grave, find out where he was buried or anything like that? What's funny is I've only talked with one employee who was there long enough to actually supposedly remember him, Uh but I have not seen a picture or anything like that. No. Is he a confirmed individual though? Is he past the point of apocryphal? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and honestly, he was the one I noticed the least, so I can't tell the most about him. I could tell more about Eddie, though. Hey, did you see that lecture series called The Surprising Origins of Christmas Traditions over at The Great Courses Plus? I did. And as we always say, The Great Courses Plus probably has a series on just about any topic you can think of. But if you're looking for something that might have a connection to the season in the current series we're learning from, Warriors, Queens, and Intellectuals, 36 Great Women Before 1400, there is one that might have a tie-in. Ah, you might be talking about lecture number 13, Pulcheria Defends the Virgin Mary. I am. You know, Pulcheria was only 13 years old in the year 412 when she took control of the eastern portion of the Roman Empire, saving the Theodosian dynasty and changing the way Christians would venerate the Virgin Mary for the next thousand years. Right. Her father, Emperor Arcadius, had died in 408, leaving her brother Theodosius II as the heir and titular emperor at only seven years old. But of course, powerful people sought to gain power over the throne by taking advantage of him and his four sisters. But that's when Polcaria took control of the imperial family herself, serving as regent for a few years until Theodosius turned 15. And she would continue to serve as his main advisor for the rest of their lives. When her grandfather, Theodosius the Great, declared Roman Catholicism as the only permitted religion, the people came to believe that the Theodosian dynasty ruled with God's blessing, and this belief helped Pulcheria to consolidate power for her and her brother through her own deep religious beliefs, further cemented by actions like her public vow of virginity for her and her sisters. She did this not only for her faith, but also because any challenge to the Theodosian throne would come from any children the sisters had. After emerging victorious in an argument with the powerful Archbishop Nestorius, the veneration of the Virgin Mary eventually became widespread through Pulcaria's championship. I think uh, you and me, we were probably both playing Atari when we were 13. (laughs) (laughs) Well, well, yeah, but if we had the Great Courses Plus back then, at least we could have been learning all sorts of things other than how to play Pitfall. Uh, Talk about pitfalls. Well, that's why the Great Courses Plus is such a terrific gift for anyone, but especially the young people you know who can start to make learning a part of their daily routine. And if you just want to see what we've been talking about, here's a terrific offer to try it out. Our listeners can get a free trial of unlimited access to the entire library. Check out everything from the rise of Rome to the laws of thermodynamics and all that's in between. And all you have to do is sign up now through our special URL to start your free trial. Go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash legends. Remember, that's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash legends. This is Marco Acevedo in Evanston, Illinois. And when I'm not terrifying my kids with bedtime campfire tales in the tent in our living room, I'm listening to Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. Okay, we're going to play the first of four EVPs that Connor sent to us to share with you guys tonight. These are pretty crazy. These are all from the Stanley. I think you're going to enjoy them. He also sent a sheet describing what him and Carl had down for each of the clips. 
This one is related to Paul, who you just heard about, the security guard, the deceased security guard at the Stanley. And this is the description that goes with it. This is from Carl Pfeiffer, written into the description for this particular EVP. Quote, my first time at the hotel, there were six of us in the room. Three men, Vince, I think, Chris McCune, myself, and Chris's now wife, and my ex-girlfriend. We walk in at two in the morning. We see a bunch of alcohol left sitting out. We're laughing about stealing the beer. And then we get this voice, as we think, the old maintenance worker, Paul, saying, hey, seemingly from down the hallway, which none of us heard or responded to. And the voice is very different from the other three male voices heard on the clip. The voice comes exactly at 26 seconds. So we're going to play this for you. About 30 seconds in, listen for a hey that sounds like somebody else down the hallway. And then you'll notice that they don't react to it, which is a lot of times how EVPs are because you don't hear it in the moment. You don't hear it until you hear the recording. This is exactly as they sent it to us. It has like food in there. <laughs> no, play with that. Play with the lock itself. Yeah, it, it's not like it can jiggle itself into a locked position. No, no, this thing, this, this yeah. gotta turn. It's got a turn. Oh, look, we could have quite the party. Yeah. Yeah. There's orange juice, you just have mimosas and break in the morning. <laughs> yeah, call it the morning. Yeah, there's no way that it could, like, I want to steal me some Easy Street. That's, that's my beer. Anyway, that's, that's funny. Yeah, there's a bunch of Easy Street. Yeah, jeez. It does shut on its own, but how <laughs> no, play with that. Play with the lock itself. Yeah, it, it's not like it can jiggle itself into a locked position. No, no, this thing, this has got to turn. It's got to turn. Oh, look, we could have quite the party. Yeah. Yeah. There's orange juice, you just have mimosas and break in the morning. <laughs> yeah, call it the morning. Yeah, there's Ooh. no way that it could, like, I want to steal me some easy itself. street. That's, that's my beer. Anyway, that's, that's funny. Yeah, there's a bunch of easy street. Yeah, <laughs> it, go, does it, shut? it does shut on its own, but how... So that's just like these EVPs that we've talked about before with James A. Willis, where there's a yeah. voice. And in this case, it's not a voice that anyone knows. It's a completely foreign voice. The only explanation would be that somebody else was in there down the hall who actually said that. But what you have to understand or what you have to think with these guys specifically, because we know how they operate... If somebody had been down the hall, they would have known that. And they also would have checked for that. They would have known, and you can tell this when you watch Spirits of the Stanley, they know who's in the building and not in the building and what's going on and where everyone is. And the other thing that's really interesting is they don't react to it, which is another characteristic of this kind of EVP that's really fascinating because they're not hearing it in real time. They only hear it on the recording later. Sometimes you hear it in real time. Other times you don't. This is one of those where you would think if a stranger was in the building and somebody went, hey, from down the hall, they'd be like, who was that? Yeah. But they don't. Yeah. And that's all married into the audio, so you know it's real audio, unless, of course, they're going to some elaborate prank to trick us and everyone else, which is just not what I think is happening here. And that's another interesting aspect I find about EVPs is direction and location of the apparent sound and that you're not hearing it. But on the recording, it sounds like it's coming from a very specific location. It's not everything appears to be like right up close to the recorder. Yeah. Which, like, if it's a disembodied and ethereal spirit of the ethers, it could be anywhere or something leaning in, whispering into the recorder. It seems to be emanating from a specific spot. Now, logically, you could say, well, if this is real and they have the recorder near them, which it sounds like it is because it's they're coming in very clearly. Yeah. So the recorder sounds like it's right next to them. Yeah. And this thing gets picked up on the recorder down the hall, and it's clear on the recorder uh, that we can hear. They didn't hear it. They should have been able to hear it, but they didn't. So it's obviously beyond the range of their hearing, or there is something blocking them physically or spiritually blocking them from hearing it. So that's interesting in that it is coming from a specific location down the hall. And I need to look more into this, but I'm not sure what class it is, but it's a, it's a pretty good class. You know, they have different classes of that's right. Yeah. class A, class B, class C. But it's pretty clear. It's pretty obvious. And other ones that we've heard are, are very subtle. You can hear it after a while. But, of course, we all like the ones where you don't have to guess. And like you said, that's why you do a lockdown. That's why we called it lockdown at Waverly is that the building is locked down. It's only them. There shouldn't be anybody sneaking on to the property right now. 
And if there is hotel staff, they know they're there. So they know not to come in and, and start rattling doors and all that. Well, yeah. And on top of that, if somebody's coming in and goes, hey, yeah. then they're probably going to follow through with whatever their intention is. Like, hey, what are you doing in here? Or what are you guys <laughs> well, doing down here tonight? What's going on down there? Whatever. You don't yeah, just go, hey, yeah. and vanish. Well, yeah. And if you hear that, you're going to be startled because there shouldn't be anybody else there. You right. know, even if it's a, a human voice from a body, from a corporeal body, that's going to startle you and you're going to want to know who's gotten into the place. But really compelling and pretty clear. Yeah, and the other thing that they're saying in this description of this particular file is they were laughing and joking about stealing the beer from this party (laughs) that had happened, right? right? And what's funny about that is that's when the security guard might come in and be like, hey, no, (laughs) you're not doing that. If that's Paul, maybe it makes sense. Right. Well, this next one is a Paul EVP2, and this one takes a microphone out of the equation because it's a spirit box. And the spirit box, you'll be hearing about or have heard about how it works, the words come out of it. And this is pretty amazing. So I'm going to read the description for this particular clip. It's a clip of a voice we've gotten fairly used to coming in over the spirit box. It was caught during one of Carl and Callie's public hunts a while back. Paul clearly saying his name. Here's what Carl had to say about this particular The Paul clip. It's self-explanatory and it stands for itself. We were sitting with a group in Paul's room coaxing him to come through the spirit box. Because we had so many DJ voices coming through, we encouraged him to make it as loud as possible. And what that means is this spirit box was working with scanning radio waves, so it's picking up DJs saying things. And sometimes that's where your message comes from, is this little snippet of a word or a full word or even a sentence from a DJ. But this is an additional sound that they're looking for. So they encouraged Paul to make his name as loud as possible, given the circumstances of the scanning that was going on at that given moment, that given night. It seems that Paul complied. Now, the curious part was that it was even louder on the recording than in person, as they remember. The clip is left long to give a good sense of the normal volume of the DJ. So here's that clip. We're going to play it twice. The first time you'll hear it completely unaffected. The second time it'll be slightly enhanced in our post, just so you can clearly hear what we're talking about. So here we go. Quiet. Paul, if you're here, you're going to have to make it really loud. Cool. Really. So quiet. Paul, if you're here, you're going to have to make it really loud. Cool. Really. Man, that is amazing. That one actually reminds me of a subreddit called Gifts That End Too Soon. Because even <laughs> though you've already heard the EVP, yeah. I really enjoy everybody going, oh, like I want that to keep going. I want to hear more about what they said, you know, right yeah. after they heard it. But one of the things that Carl and Connor are saying in their description was that it's even louder on this playback than it was when they heard it in the room. But I mean, there is no question that that's Paul. And the reason, like they said, they left that clip longer is because you can hear what's going on with the DJs, you know, (laughs) and you hear these voices. (laughs) Yeah. Nothing is even close to as clear as that Paul. And it comes right after they ask for it, right after they ask for it. That's what I'm talking about is that there is direct context in that. Well, if what's funny is you're talking about the snippets of DJs coming through. I did hear the phrase nut job. Oh God, yes, by, that's the other thing. Somebody on the, yeah, <laughs> that's right a radio in the DJ. Middle, which I can't believe <laughs> yeah. they didn't say anything about. That is funny because right in the middle of that, of all the words coming through, you hear nut job. Yeah. <laughs> and that's one of those things. And later you'll hear next week when we talk more in depth about the Estes method, you'll hear Connor talking about how you have to say whatever you hear, whatever you hear. And if, if you had been yeah. wearing a headset that was monitoring that, it would have been right. your job at that moment to yell out nut job. <laughs> <laughs> so when you listen, if you go back and listen and you'll hear nut job, but then you hear down the stream, Paul, and you can't help but think, well, maybe nut job was a pertinent word. Maybe that was directed at somebody in the room. Or, you know, who knows? Or maybe it was some other voice commenting on Paul. Who knows what that is? Yeah, you do get some of that in the series. 
But like I said, the further out it gets, then maybe you're doing more speculation on that. And, you know, That's maybe true. they would say, because you'll see in the series where they say like, well, what do you think of this person? And it'll say like, loser. It's like, well, wait, are you, you know, they're joking around. Like, are you calling me a loser? Well, that's the thing. But in this case, they say, you're going to have to say your name louder, Paul, and you get back Paul. Yeah. And the other thing that's interesting is that there's an accent on it, a Boston accent where I believe Paul was from. Yes, that is really fascinating. And the other thing I'll say about the nicknames or whatever is if they keep recurring, because one of the things that Connor talks about is how Eddie, this other spirit, has mm -hmm. a nickname for Carl. He calls him asshole. Pardon my yeah. French. You do know that if it keeps coming up, then it, it's a recurring nickname for you. I mean, how many DJs are randomly saying that every time you're going to do this? Uh, you can't even say that <laughs> right. on the radio, really, unless right. you're doing something late at night. So anyway, it's interesting. But we're going to go back to the interview now, and we'll be back a little bit later with another EVP. Now, Eddie, let's talk about Eddie, because this is the one that you guys said in your series. I mean, I don't want to do a lot of spoilers, but basically you said he was a hitchhiker. He came there from somewhere else with someone. How did you come to that conclusion? Can you talk about the origins of Eddie? Yeah. What's fascinating is we had a clear story to who these ghosts were of the Stanley Hotel. And it's a very interesting line to walk where it's like, well, I, I know what the ghost stories allegedly are, but me being not only a tour guide here, but actually being charged with documenting the actual activity at the hotel, I have to draw that line of taking in people's stories and realizing that they're not my stories and waiting for something to happen to me. The stories of Lucy and Paul are sort of fabled legends. And then suddenly, when we started to do our investigations with people in the night, we would have people there for about six or seven hours a night with us. We started to notice one particular incident that kept happening over and over again that we couldn't figure out. And what would happen is we would all be sitting in a room. I guess I should clarify first. Part of my job was to take people on these seven-hour ghost hunts. And the first hour and a half or so would be okay, this is, you know, how you use an audio recorder, cutesy stuff like that. And then I think people didn't really know what they were getting into because what we would do is we would then go into the outbuildings because it's an active hotel. So naturally, I would want to take people where there was nobody else. And so we would go to these places and I would sit this couple down in a room here and then I'll sit a couple people down over here. Oh, this haunted room is empty. Let's go up here. You guys go into 428 and check it out and have these people report back to me what happened. And then I would have everybody gather up in a group and we would have everybody in one room together. The room that we would most frequently do that in was in the basement of the concert hall, which is the old concert hall down at the bottom hill at the bottom of the property. We started to notice a smell. And there was a ghost that we jokingly referred to as the smelly man. He would appear essentially through having this scent come over very strongly throughout the group, and then something would move. It would be a precursor to something else happening. Somebody would feel a touch on their shoulder or a kiss on the cheek. Somebody would grab their behind. A light would turn on. A flashlight would jump up into the air. There would be this smell that would predicate something else occurring. So we just jokingly started to call this ghost, the smelly man. And we wouldn't tell people the story because we had nothing else to go off of. Then we started to notice it more and more. And then after that smell occurred, we started to hear the word Eddie come across on EVP recordings, come across on devices like the spirit box, like different methods that people were using. And once people noticed it 20 or 30 times, I started to take note. And it would sometimes be a variation, Edward, Ed, Eddie. And so we started to think, well, maybe this is the smelly man. It was pretty clear that whatever other ghosts were at the property didn't really like Eddie because there wouldn't be much else happening if he ever appeared in a night. Didn't know anything else about him. And he never told us anything through any devices, through the Estes method, through anything like that about his backstory. He just was this prankster ghost who would appear through this smell, which eventually changed into a good smell, almost like dryer sheets. And I wonder if it's because he became self-conscious. I'm not sure. And then something would occur. Eddie started then to say some scary words across devices. 
we would get recordings of words like blood, murder, stab, choke, and scary things that would scare tourists who were just there, you know, to see what's going on at the Stanley. And so we started, Carl and I walked into the empty building one night and had a heart to heart with the seemingly empty room and said, if there's a ghost named Eddie here, you're really scaring people. And we need to sort of keep this in check. But he never went away. Instead, he started calling us names. We would turn on recorders. I was nerd and Carl was <laughs> asshole. And, <laughs> and so this ghost was the most prevalent spirit in my time there. What I love about the story is that there's no fabled myth as to who this individual is. He just showed up one day. Okay, a few questions about him because I'm curious about it. First of all, the smell, the initial smell, with without getting too graphic, are we talking about bad smell like rotten trash smell or a fart smell or a dead body smell or like a... It was a BO smell. It's yeah. like an open hockey bag in a hot car. Okay, mm-hmm. okay. <laughs> and so yeah. this guy is just like this interloper who just found his way to the Stanley somehow. So you think you guys deduced that because he sort of showed up out of the blue that maybe he came with a guest or something somehow found his way there just randomly. Right. Because in the subtitles, you'll see when you're watching it, it says, I believe that Eddie was possibly a spirit that attached itself to a guest in 2013 and decided to never leave. How do you know that? That's around the time when we first started to notice his activity. That was our best hypothesis as to how he got in the hotel in the first place. We thought that maybe because he was such an attention seeker, which is rare in the spirit realm, it's rare, A, to have an intelligent spirit who will occasionally respond, but B, to have a spirit that just wants that attention and feeds off the hilarity of scaring people, that we think maybe he just came up there one night, saw that this is where he could have his spotlight, so night after night he would appear. You know, and I guess I should clarify, not night after night, but enough, you know, five, 10% of our time there, enough to keep us fascinated by him. Wow. And you never got any real details on him of any kind? Never got any details. Our best guess was that he was possibly stabbed to death just based off of the words that he started to give. When we sort of asked him if that was his background story, he kind of stopped saying those words. Honestly, mostly he just kind of poked fun at us, which was just great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So moving on from Eddie and Paul, what about Lucy, the little girl? Lucy's story is particularly fascinating because it has an entire story arc. What I was told when I started working at the hotel was that in the 1970s, there was a young woman in her late teens or early 20s who was a runaway and became homeless and took up residence in the concert hall, which, as we said, in the 1970s, it was a particularly bad economic time for the hotel. It didn't seem incredibly far-fetched that there could be a young homeless woman who would sleep there in the nighttime. I was told that that happened, and they discovered her one day, and they said, you know, I'm sorry, miss, you need to go somewhere else, and that she was found frozen to death in the town of Estes Park later that winter. And that since she had passed away, she still appears to people in the concert hall. If you look back at some of the old original Ghost Hunters stories, some people would say the old homeless woman. I was always told that she was young. So that clarifier has always been kind of a a mystery to me. Then what happened with Lucy is we would notice occasional activity some of the best voices. And you know what? I'll send you this clip. My favorite voice that I've ever caught on tape ghost-wise is this high-pitched voice of this, that the recorder was alone up on the top floor of the concert hall of it sounds like a young voice saying, come out and let's play. Very friendly. It's fascinating. So she has this very light, shrill, kind of high-pitched voice. She would sing songs. We would hear humming It was a very light and pleasant energy when she was around. She particularly, I think, had a crush on Carl. There was one heartwarming moment that I remember that Carl was sitting there and communicating with Lucy through various methods. She seemed to like to talk to him. There was one night where we had somebody holding this old thing called a cell sensor, which is 
debatable in terms of what it can actually do picking up EMF, but got to a point where we could set it down in the bathroom floor and have, you know, light up once for yes and three times for no. And he had this conversation for about an hour and a half. He said, would you like me to bring you flowers? And she lit it off like crazy. And I remember going with Carl to Safeway to buy Lucy a bouquet of flowers. Wow. He said, you know, we always sort of gave Lucy permission to, if she didn't want to stay there, to come home with us, that she was welcome wherever she wants to be. A very pleasant, comforting energy. Her story gets particularly interesting when we started to actually try to find her. We had heard this legend, had had some experiences with her, had caught her voice, had heard her humming and her singing regularly, regularly enough to make it really worth looking into. We looked up some death records. We never found anybody in the entire Larimer County, Colorado, who has ever passed away from exposure. That is something that should have a record. In addition, we talked with one of the daughters of the owner of the hotel from the 1970s. And she said, no, in in the 70s, they would have like Rotary Club meetings and the Elks Club would meet in the concert hall. They would pay a small fee and that was how the hotel was trying to stay afloat. So naturally, you would expect that they would know if there was a woman living in this building where they were having meetings. And so we started to basically tell the people on our tours the entirety of her story because that's just so I could sleep at night my own conscience you know I I didn't want to be telling people something I didn't think was true so I would tell them this is what I was told but we can't find her doesn't seem to be a plausible story and after we started saying that we started to notice less and less and less from Lucy until eventually we didn't hear much at all really what do you think that's about you know, I, I think that the Stanley Hotel is haunted because people believe that it is actually haunted. I think that a story like Lucy's was told to tens of thousands of people on these tours for four years. And once we started to actually look into it and people's own mind started to doubt the validity of that story and doubt the possibility of having an interaction with that spirit because they didn't know if she was real she started to appear less. What do you think is happening? And we've talked about this a bunch on our show over the years, you know, we into the whole idea of the tulpa, something that's created by thought or these manifestations. I mean, in a case like this, where you're seeming to have sentient interaction, do you think it is something made out of whole cloth from conscious what people are wanting to see or that it's something else manifesting and trying to communicate in a different way, like, I'm, you know, are you not pleased with this form kind of thing, where I'm trying to communicate with you, and the only way I know how to do it is to appear or interact in a way that you can understand, sort of like, you know, the end of contact, to make it kind of a stupid reference, but, you know. (laughs) But, like, yeah, I guess, what do you think that's about? You know, after hearing so many thousands of ghost stories from different guests and witnesses and, and people, I think there's a mental thing to it. I think that paranormal activity can absolutely be real. And this is something that I've picked up from the New Kirks as well. I think that it can be something that is real that is also occurring within our heads, which is fascinating. And that, I think, is a lot of Lucy's story. But then again, it's a complete opposite, in my mind, logically, from Eddie's story. We had no expectations of experiencing the kind of activity that we did with that ghost but we had every expectation to be experiencing activity from Lucy. And so when we started to doubt Lucy, she started to appear less. And then suddenly this new figure that we had no idea just appeared. Yeah, very odd. Well, here's a major question that I had watching the series and talking about your expectations. This hotel was opened in 1909, just past the turn of the century. Why do you think that there weren't any interactions with ghosts from decades past. You know, we did a tour and we covered the Waverly Hills Sanatorium. And what's common there is hearing about people who are actually patients there and they keep coming back and young people and older people. And and so much of it has to do with the people that were staying there at the time, which may or may not have passed away there. But what about the Stanley Hotel that makes it such that you are more so to interact with more contemporary ghosts? not somebody from the 1920s or 30s or 50s or whatever. That's something I've, I've thought about. And, you know, 
in my mind, places other famous haunted locations like Waverly Hills, like Eastern State, are locations that these spirits are in because that's what they're familiar with. And that's potentially where, of course, there's a theory that people stick around where they died. Of course, people have died at the Stanley. It's a 115-year-old hotel. But it was not a place of death. It was a place of summer vacation. It was a happy place. And I think that those places fall into a different, whole different category. The reason that I think the Stanley Hotel is haunted is because it's a stage. It's a mecca of people who go to this location because it's the Disneyland of going out there to see ghosts and not necessarily in a scary way. It's fun. It's the shining. It's shaking up people's own conscious brains when they're there thinking, whoa, I'm in this weird kind of spooky, but fun and very pretty place. And I don't know how it works, but I would imagine it's just kind of beaming this signal out to the spirit world. So if they want to be chatty, maybe that's, that's where they'll go. I know one thing we all kind of grin and bear around the holidays is all the old folks telling their stories over and over again. But let me tell you from experience, once they're gone, once they're gone, that's one thing you'll cherish and you'll miss hearing them tell these stories in their own words. That's why StoryWorth is such a brilliant and thoughtful gift. It can be hard keeping these memories alive and preserved somehow, let alone just staying connected with family members across the country. But StoryWorth is the perfect way to record and share those memories. And it's also a lot of fun for everyone involved. It turns into a keepsake you can pass down through generations. StoryWorth is an online service that helps your loved ones or even friends tell the stories of their lives through thought-provoking questions about their memories and personal thoughts. And the way StoryWorth works is, every week they email your family member or friend different story prompts. Basically questions you might not have ever thought to ask them. Ones that really rekindle those fond memories and get those tales and family legends going. <laughs> yeah, how many times have you heard a really wild anecdote or something surprising from someone you thought you really knew well, and you ask them, how come you never told me this before? And the answer, well, you never asked me before. But that's one thing I love about StoryWorth, is that the questions they come up with are pretty clever, and ones you may have been hesitant to ask yourself. That's right. Like, what have been some of your life's greatest surprises? And what's one of the riskiest things you've ever done? So, Forrest, did you get any interesting stories from your dad? Oh, yeah. One time when he was a kid, some friends of his got a hold of a JATO rocket, you know, a jet-assisted takeoff rocket that was used to help with getting aircraft off the ground. Well, his friends tried to launch it straight up into the air, but it fell over from the stand it was on and shot across the highway, nearly taking out a couple of cars. Oh, man, that's crazy. Your dad's crazy. Well, <laughs> and, uh, well, it wasn't him. It was his friends. But he was there, and they were like, oh, my gosh, like, that could have been really bad. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, people have always done interesting stuff, but you'll never hear about it unless you ask. After one year, StoryWorth will compile every answered question and photo you choose to include into a beautiful keepsake book that's shipped for free. And I think you'll be surprised and touched by a lot of the answers you'll get, and so will your future family members. It's really a terrific way to keep your family history accessible. And you can also invite an unlimited number of people to receive your loved one's stories. So preserve and pass on those memories with StoryWorth, the most meaningful gift for your family. Sign up today by going to storyworth.com slash astonishing. You'll get $20 off your first purchase. That's storyworth.com slash astonishing for $20 off. So did you end up winning Turkey Dennis in the Best <laughs> Fiends Thanksgiving Challenge? I did, and you didn't, I take it. Hey, man, I had family in town, all right? <laughs> Well, what better time to slink away to be alone and knock out a few levels of best fiends than around the holidays with relatives? Uh, maybe so. Usually I slink off and knock out a nap, but I can't say oh, that I on see. the air. What level are you on? <laughs> I don't want to say because you'll only get jealous. Uh, all right. I'm at least a hundred levels ahead of you. Dang, man. I, now I know what you're doing instead of responding to my emails. Uh, but not to worry. I have the Friend Miss Eve challenge to get ahead of you and win the Elf Carmen Fiend before you do. By the way, uh, just what kind of fiend is Carmen? I believe she's a cochineal, which is a scale insect from which the natural dye Carmen is derived. Get it? Yeah. 
Carmen, Carmen. The insect produces carminic acid that's extracted from the body and eggs, then mixed with aluminum or calcium salts to make bright red carmine dye, also known as cochineal, which nowadays is primarily used as a colorant in food and lipstick. <laughs> I, I did not need to know all that. <laughs> you see? Not only am I severely beating you at a really fun and challenging puzzle game, we're actually learning something here. Well, I do like how there's little Easter eggs of references for the adults who play, like there's a Matrix Dojo fight scene in their latest animated short, The Fight Before Christmas. Best Fiends does have a lot to offer for anyone who plays, and anyone can play it. But yeah, there's some funny inside jokes here and there just for the adults. And if you stay engaged with it and keep advancing, they treat you like a VIP. And since you don't need the internet to play, it's a great way to pass the time, especially when traveling for the holidays. So engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this five-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Forrest and Scott, thank you for supporting their sponsors. This is Amelia Cotter. Now back to the show. Well, speaking of Lucy, we did want to play one of two remaining EVPs we have. Both are Lucy. This one is another one that I found super compelling. This is called the Jen and Mike Lucy EVP Bathroom. And uh, here's a description of it from Carl Pfeiffer. Quote, it's some interesting audio. Myself and Callie were leading a private investigation with Jen and Lee Kirkland in the woman's bathroom of the concert hall. We're using the spirit box and a faint voice perhaps says, hi. Jen then echoes, hi, question mark, then pauses and then says, Lucy, was that you? Which I believe was in reference to the hi that was heard. However, during her pause, before asking if that was Lucy, a woman's voice speaks clearly enough that they don't think it was through the spirit box and nobody reacted to it. So they think it's an EVP. They don't think they heard it when they were there. And it sounds like she says, it's Jen and Mike, which is funny because our guests were Jen and Lee. Perhaps Lucy got his name wrong. The Jen and Mike EVP comes right at 10 seconds. So when you listen to this, this is another case of one where they got something on the recording and they're classifying it as an EVP because they did not hear it while they were there in the room. This is different from like Paul's spirit box recording, but it's similar to the recording of Paul down the hallway going, hey, because they didn't hear that in the situation either. So check this out. We're going to play it twice for you. The first time exactly as it was sent to us and the second time with the audio a little enhanced so you can clearly hear the Jen and Mike, and you're going to be surprised at just how clear this is and how much it sounds like a little girl, which is what leads them to believe it's Lucy at the Stanley Hotel. Where did the foul-smelling spirit come from? Hi. Lucy, is that you? Where did the foul smelling spirit come from? Hi. Lucy, is that you? Right. So that's not like our EVP from the Sally House that, you know, sounds angry and scary, <laughs> but you can't make any yeah. words out really. This right. is somebody clearly saying. Jen and Mike, even if you're misinterpreting yeah. it. And you have to think about that. But maybe we've got this name wrong. Maybe it's not. I mean, the Mike sounds pretty clear. Maybe it's not Jen. And again, who is Mike? Mike doesn't work in this situation, but they're clearly pointing that out. They're not trying to connect it to somebody that wasn't there, which is another thing I like about mm -hmm. their objectivity. But it's pretty amazing. I mean, what did you think of that one, Forrest? Yeah, I, you can clearly hear, hi, Jen and Mike. And that kind of sing song delivery there. Yeah. And it might be Mike. Like I said, Jen to me, that name sounds pretty clear. Mike, you could interpret that maybe as another word that I'm just not getting, but that's also what I hear. Something like, hi, Jen and Mike. Yeah. And it's so clear. Yeah, we're not used to that. We're used to really loud, angry, ag aggressive, and staticky EVPs that we capture. Yeah, used to, in air quotes. We're used to that. Uh-huh. And another thing I want to stress is that you probably are aware of, as the listener, that these don't happen very often. You may get a handful in your career investigating this kind of stuff that are 
this high quality. And certainly they didn't get this the first night out. But on the other hand, you could get something like that the first night. There's no rhyme or reason to it. It's just whenever the conditions are right. I do believe that there are some environmental conditions that affect these things as well as emotional and personality wise and spiritually. So that was a pretty good one. And I think it would be hard to claim that that's some kind of radio interference because it sounds like somebody who's right there. It just doesn't sound the same. So in this case, if you're going to try and debunk it, you're going to have to look to somebody who was there that they're pretending they couldn't hear or was purposely fake. And I don't believe that's the case. So it's a pretty good one. Well, let's get back to the interview now. I want to ask you about this other character that was a smaller character in your series and also a person that was helping you, Steve. Maybe you guys weren't sure whether this was the communications you were getting were relating to a ghost named Steve or whether it was referring to your friend Steve, who's your super savvy tech guy who was inventing new things like the laser light sensor that would trip and let you guys know if something was moving in a hallway that you weren't in. You had some stuff in there, but not a whole ton about these interactions with this Steve guy who was saying things like screw you and other stuff like that. What was that experience about? And did you manage to get him to go away or back off? It's very kind of funny. Essentially, what we did, Steve was a person who came around and it was an energy and a presence that was very foreboding, was not very welcome, was not kind of scary, but trickster like, like Eddie. This was something that was very much the whole room would just get pitch black and you couldn't see the hand in front of your face. Keep in mind, this was not a typical stumbling around ghost hunt. This is a building that I had spent thousands upon thousands of hours in. I knew every creak and sound and everything. And the room would entirely change. We got to a point where we could walk in I mean, and frankly, I'm not, I, I don't even really believe in mediums. I think psychic abilities could be possible. But I got to a point where I personally could walk into the building and be like, huh, it feels kind of strange in here tonight because it's, it's a second home. And Steve was a presence that was very odd. We don't know what happened, but essentially <laughs> we told Eddie that this person named Steve was scaring the guests. And then we never noticed anything from him again. <laughs> so Eddie scared him off with his BO or something. Well, no, at this point Maybe. he was dryer sheets. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Maybe. Well, he's sporty scented. Going back quickly to a series we covered a while back on Skinwalker Ranch. I don't know if you're familiar with Skinwalker Ranch, Connor, but there was this idea there, for me anyway, when we went through and did our research on that and covered it, that it was, like you said, this kind of mecca. It seems to me like a bus stop for everything paranormal that could possibly happen. And that is an interesting idea. And, you know, the idea of the trickster as well, it does feel a little bit like with this cast of characters that in the darkness, maybe they see, it's like the upside down in Stranger Things, they see this light over here and they walk over to it because that's a place where they can cross over and interact with the living. Or, you know, maybe the differences between us and them are less about being living and dead and more about dimensions or multiverses or something. Who knows? But Absolutely. It could be because those are also the kinds of locations where people are thinking about paranormal activity. Right. How often are people sitting in their day job thinking about ghosts? Well, shoot, now you're at a business conference at the Stanley Hotel. Of course you're thinking about ghosts. Right. Well, speaking of interaction and mediumship, you seem to be the one person in the group who had the most complete sentences and most interaction and most responses from the SB7 spirit box and the most sensitive out of everybody. What do you think of that? It's really not necessarily a hat or a role that I intended or necessarily wanted to put on. <laughs> yeah. I thrive on data and I hope that people see this as well in Hellier. I love maps and graphs and trying to keep track of things. Being the person who would hear the most, I don't know why. Of course, some people have said, oh, it's because you've died. It's because you've had these surgeries. It's because things have happened. But I like to think of myself as a good listener and sitting back and, and I practice meditation and maybe it was easier for me to enter into that zone for them to communicate with. That's interesting. Yeah, because you do seem like you're channeling. And also, I felt like towards the end of the series, and again, and you ha we have to warn Forrest about spoilers because he loves to give spoilers. I don't think we should spoil uh, Like Scott series. doesn't uh, announce no, everything but, we're going to do for the next six months. Well, I'm just saying, yeah. I think that... <laughs> 
towards the end of the series, it was clear as it was winding down that you felt very connected to the things that you were interacting with, which brings me back actually, and I had a couple more questions about Steve and also the one thing that seemed to come up, you guys kept getting the number 440 over and over. Did -hmm. you ever figure anything out about that or that's still an unsolved mystery? It's a continuing mystery in our lives. That's why I love doing shows like this, Ideas on 440. I know that it's the Hertz cycle for the note of A. Yeah. That has come across my feed. What else it could mean, I'm not sure. But it was a very legitimate thing over months that we kept hearing that number, use 440. During the inception of the method, when you would think if there is a spirit operator on the other side, maybe that's when they were like, oh, here's something new. Here's a hint that we have not deciphered yet. Well, yeah, and that's what's interesting because I came across the thing about the A note as well. And I found the the first thought that I had was that you said it was coming across months. So it wasn't necessarily just coming across when Steve, your friend Steve, not Steve the baddie ghost, but Steve, mm-hmm. who was the tech guy who was, you know, inventing new stuff. I was wondering if maybe it was some sort of message to him about how he was building things or something that like if you could put it into a realm that he would understand whether it was cycles or hertz or something like that, that would help him figure out how to tune the gear better for maybe the Estes method or something else. Steve's thought on it as well. One of Steve's continuing projects and hobbies and joys is uh, recreating some of the work of Konstantin Radova. And so if you're able to take that germanium diode that Radova was using apparently so successfully back in the day, how can we bring that into the modern day? I mean, the schematics are online. Yes. It's something that's right there. Can you tell our listeners about the Radova box? We've mentioned it in the past, but you might be better able to summarize it. Yeah, Konstantin Radova, he was a German researcher who sort of fell into the paranormal realm. He would do this thing where he would have certain noises playing while he was doing tape recordings. And he was really sort of one of the founding fathers, along with Friedrich Jurgensen of people like that, of EVP and modern day ITC research. He published entire manuscripts of his conversations with ghosts in his book, Breakthrough, most famously. He was, yeah, one of the founding pioneers of EVP. What's interesting is he used noise that he would introduce into the feed as well, giving that Play-Doh, that silly putty kind of theory that you had, give them something to form sound and syllables off of. What's interesting about Radova is that his ghosts were all polyglot. They could speak six or seven different languages. So it's a continuing realm that I'm fascinated in exploring more. Do you continue to stay in touch with Steve? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a little bit of a sidetrack, but are you familiar with the DR60 for EVPs, the Panasonic? Yeah. Oh, yeah. What's your verdict on that device? Have you used it at all, or do you have any thoughts on it? I have used it. Here's what's interesting. I have not a professional background, but probably just as much as you guys sort of interest in sound, the way that sound works. What's interesting about the DR60 is that The classic thing that you always hear is it's like these EVP recorders are here, they can hear more than our ears can hear. That's not technically the case. Our ears can hear all the way from 20 up to 20,000 kilos. The most, every single recorder, 97% of them on the market can hear exactly what the human ear can hear. What's so fascinating then, if that's the case, why can I hear this ghost's voice on my recorder, but I didn't hear it in real time? Well. Maybe it's because the ghost is electronically imprinting their voice onto that recorder. The DR60 is something that I think a lot of people love to hate. And I think I might fall into that category sometimes because let's be honest, the sound quality is awful. Maybe it gives them the right amount of noise or Play-Doh, as we said, to imprint their voice onto though. I'm not sure. Yeah, we had a bad experience with one. So, (laughs) I mean, yeah, it was a whole series that we did on the Sally House. Mm -hmm. We got a recording there on it. Well, I I continued to use it and kept getting more results with it. it. Yeah, so uh, and and Connor, we'll talk to you later about it. Sorry, Uh, but uh, what's I don't know if it's this specific unit, but there's something about the one that we have, whether you believe it or not, has given a lot of phenomenal results and we'd love to invite you in and and Carl and whomever to be a part of it because there's something 
quite unusual and specific about it. It's hard to explain. And and uh, yeah, there's something to it where it's beyond, because again, you'll play this for a lot of people and they'll say like, well, it was a crummy recorder. And of course it's, it was so bad. People were turning it back into Panasonic for refunds. And it's more than that because I've, again, being in sound for many years as well as video, I've been around crappy equipment and it doesn't behave like that. It does not produce sounds that you just know are words. You can't really make them out. Yeah, there's an organic them, analog nature to what this thing's doing. That There's an implied sentience, even though you can't follow what you're hearing. So what's interesting, yeah, the only thing I'll say about it, continuing on here, is that it does have elements like the SB7 and that it is providing a medium for the formation of speech. And sometimes it's very clear and sometimes it's overmodulated, you could tell. But what I believe, what I wanted to say about the, the Radova Box, one of our friends who is a paranormal investigator and side tinkerer and inventor has created a box. And from one of the aspects that I thought was interesting about the device that he created from a rod of a design is that it's meant to bypass the microphone transducer, which would lay down the signal. That's one way. And I wanted to tie this back with the Estes method. And, and one thing that maybe wanted you to comment on is that People will say, well, there you go, the transducer, the mic, it's picking up radio frequencies we can't hear or static or this and that, and that's what's getting onto the chip. And in the case of the rod of a device that our friend Roger was building, it's meant to bypass that. So it's a, you can eliminate that aspect of it, of a microphone picking up something that maybe we can't hear or that is just electronic static. One thing I wanted to comment about the Estes method that people may not understand about it is that when you listen to the SB7 and you think you're expecting a response because of the you heard the question proposed by yourself or someone else in the group, that's maybe influencing you. You're now biased. We asked it its favorite color, so I think I just heard it say blue or red or orange or a number. But with the Estes method and blocking people's hearing is that they don't hear the question and they can't see gestures or read lips, even subconsciously. So it's a cleaner approach. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. That's the entirety of the foundation of it. Honestly, it came into inception because we got tired of the people who would go on our tours when we would play that for 10, 15 minutes, picking out exactly what they wanted to hear because I didn't think it was real interaction. Instead, I said, well, just you listen. Well, just just all listen. You know, and Carl sort of, that dawned on him one night, ended up being a brilliant idea. Totally non-biased. Yeah, it eliminates the confirmation bias. It, I guess it creeps back in sometimes a little bit. And you gave a nod to this in your series. Once you realize that you might be talking to something that you've interacted with before, then, of course, you've got a certain vocabulary that might pop back into your head. But in terms of new information or a cold reading of some kind, it's different. Which brings me to another question, I guess, relating to the spirits there. Without saying, like, there was a particularly interesting event that happened at the end of the last part of your series, a physical event that was I thought was really fascinating. But without going into that, what I did want to talk about was how it seemed like as it progressed, you wound up capturing what ultimately would be the end of the paranormal tours, at least for now, at the Stanley, because the management, and if you're comfortable talking about this, I don't know what your ongoing relationship with them is and everything, but they clearly decided they wanted to stop doing paranormal investigations on site. And you guys, again, in addition to not only <laughs> just happening to catch the entire development of the Estes Method, you also captured the end of an era for you guys in terms of how many years of research and stuff you did. And I thought that was really interesting. Do you have any idea why? Because you didn't say a whole lot about it other than there was a cryptic statement that indicated that it might have been done in deference to the spirits. Yeah, and thank you for the spoiler, by the way. Uh, no, that's not a spoiler, because to <laughs> me, like, what I don't want to spoil is the last investigation you did. I thought there was some amazing stuff there, and so I'm not going to talk about that, Forrest. Okay, but we do want to know what happened, because that's alluding to my one of my first questions, is that they seem to be open and encouraging it, and now there seemed to be a decision that this has to stop or this is not the direction we want to go. What happened? It felt sudden in the series. Yeah. It felt sudden, which then, of course, your mind just starts spinning out about like, oh my God, one of the management, something happened. One of the people had an experience or there must have been some kind of tipping point, you know, and maybe we'll never get to know that. But like, how much do you know about why it stopped? It's funny. What happened is we received an email from one of the managers of the hotel that says, we've decided to start stepping away from the paranormal. 
And starting this month, we're going to stop scheduling your paranormal tours. In a way, they were like, oh, you could go and talk about the history. But of course, we're all like, uh, no, we're good. We're going to go do our own thing. Of course, now I'm glad that that happened because I'd probably still be at the hotel and I wouldn't have met up with Greg and Dana and turned my whole world upside down. Sure. But the reality is, is we received that email. I've heard two or three different stories as to what happened. Mostly, honestly, the Stanley Hotel has a larger management corporation. This guy owns like 48 hotels across America. My best guess is that he does not like ghosts and he didn't necessarily have wind of exactly what the direct management at the Stanley Hotel was allowing to happen with like full on purported, like, here's a ghost investigation. And I think it's probable that he got wind and was like, I don't want that ridiculousness at my hotel and cut the cord. Of course, since they started doing horror movie festivals and all that stuff, it's a very weird juxtaposition where he apparently the management is into the scary movies, but they don't like to talk about the actual ghost stories. Now, you could also hear some ghost stories at the hotel, but I don't believe, I don't know what they're talking about up there anymore. I think that they've financially made the decision to start to allow some ghost stories to creep through. I don't know. So maybe it was just a branding or marketing decision, like a corporate decision in a way. I, you know, earlier tonight you said, hey, if I can make it there and go up there, you'd go with me. Like, you're not persona non grata, right? You could, <laughs> would you, what happens if you walk in with your blindfold and your headphones on? Are they going <laughs> to kick you out? <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know who works up there anymore, but I'll tell you what, I yeah. still have my keys. They never asked me to turn them in. <laughs> <laughs> Good to well, know. Well, how long have you been gone now? It's been four years. Yeah. Four yeah. years. Almost as long as you were there, but not quite. Right, right. We run into that quite a bit. You talk about people who uh, take a strange turn and their preferences, and we'll have people who like the genres we cover. But when you talk to them, it's like, yeah, it's baloney. Everything you're talking about is poppycock, but I really, really enjoyed the subjects and or one aspect of a genre over another. And so I can see that. Yeah, it's just I think it's the quirky nature of this subject and that people are OK with one thing and it could be horror and and monsters and uh, they love to be scared, but they don't believe any of it or they get angry at it in some way. Yeah, they get angry. Exactly. They don't. It's a denial thing that seems to manifest as anger, or yeah. a lot of times that manifests as bad reviews over the work you do as well. <laughs> it could be, but um, it, it brings people in. <laughs> There's, oh, one thing I wanted to mention, uh, and again, it's kind of a small aside, but it was another synchronicity, you could say. So I binged a lot of the YouTube versions of Spirits of the Stanley, and I was also questioning kind of, a little bit, just wondering what was up with the number 440. And of course, that morning I woke up exactly at 440. Not thinking about anything else. I just, that's the first, I, I sat up and looked over the clock like, oh, there you go, 440. So <laughs> probably my own to subconscious. Me yeah. Speaking to you. Hey, you guys uh, may not, may be humble about this, but in a lot of ways, you are a megaphone for the phenomena as well. So maybe it wants to reach out to you. You know, I, I appreciate you saying that. We have had no shortage of weird stuff happen, which I do want to cover more when we talk about the Estes method mm -hmm. and the germination of how you got connected with Greg and Dana. And we should actually talk about them a little bit. Uh, Forrest had just made a note about this in our outline, and it is something that we wanted to ask you about because... And here's the funny thing about Greg and Dana. It's like, we have never met nor spoken to them in person. We had talked about having uh, Greg on a while, like a year or two ago. But the thing is, everybody's just so busy. And we get that because we are too. You know, we go to do a topic and it takes three years to get it down the pipeline. So, but we interact with them on Twitter. I was just communicating with Greg today on Twitter. So it's funny. I feel like I know them, but I don't know them at all. I know lots of people who have met them and, you know, and I've watched all this footage. How did you and Carl, I know you talked about this a little bit in Hellier. Yeah. For the listeners who aren't on board, and I feel like, here, you know, this classic bearing the lead thing, why don't we explain a little bit what Hellier is and how you guys got into it? And maybe you could tell our listeners a little bit about Greg and Dana and the, and the first and second season of Hellier. Yeah. So the short version is that Carl and I met Greg and Dana when they came up to one of the paranormal conferences at the Stanley Hotel that doesn't take place anymore. That was about four years ago while we were still working there. Hit it off. Great people, very friendly. Their main thing is that they run the Traveling Museum of the Paranormal and the Occult. Right. So they sort of become a safe house for people around the country who send them these terrifying objects that they're very scared of. And they all have very interesting stories. 
and they sort of give it a place. And then they travel around with these objects and tell their stories. But they also run um, some paranormal news sites, uh, Planet Weird, Weekend Weird. And so naturally, Greg receives a whole bunch of very strange emails in 2012, early on in, in his career in this on a blog, he received some emails from a man named David Christie, who said he was seeing these goblins, these small creatures who were just terrorizing his family night after night in rural Kentucky. And he sent Greg pictures of the beings, sent him footprints, sent him every piece of evidence that you would at Greg asked for, he received from this man. And then the guy completely disappeared off the face of the earth. Greg then received another mysterious email that said, why did you stop when you were so close? And a coded message that seemed to be relating to this case. Essentially, Hellier happened because Carl heard Greg tell this story on a podcast. And Carl thought, that is fascinating. We aren't working at the Stanley Hotel anymore. I have a lot of video gear that we were just using. We should go document this. It seems really fun. We thought it would turn into a short little one hour, one and a half hour thing with some friends of ours. And then it turned into an entire high strangeness mystery. Yeah. And by the way, I want to point out that podcast. And this is funny because I was direct messaging with Carl today, another person who I'm a huge fan of, but have not spoken to a person. But I was DMing him. So I was trying to get this timeline straight. The podcast that he heard was Euphemet which is Jim Perry, who is also a friend of ours who's been on the show. And I actually texted Jim today to say, I can't remember what was the time, because I was trying to put this timeline together, that you dropped that show that Carl heard. And he was like, oh my God, I was just going to text you. We haven't spoken in like six months, by the way. He was like, I was going to text you tomorrow about something else unrelated. But he said that that episode was called As Above, So Below. And that episode has not been available online. He's had it just for patrons for quite some time. But tomorrow morning, the day after we're doing this interview, which we're actually recording this on December 3rd, which is before it's going to run. But the morning of December 4th, which by the time you hear this will have already passed, he is releasing that episode again into his main feed for everybody to get to. So for those of you who are fans of Euphemet, if you want to hear Greg talking about the episode that Carl heard that led to the whole thing, that you can go find that. The show is going to be called Hellier Was Just a Symptom. He's renamed it. So Love it. Uh, look for that on the Euphemet feed. But anyway, I just wanted to interject that. So of course, what I wanted Carl to say was, oh yeah, I heard it on Astonishing Legends, but it was actually Jim Euphemet. He did it on Euphemet a whole like 15 months before we did it, that story. Because then we did, and we didn't know him at the time. 15 months later, we did a three-part in-depth series on Kelly Hopkinsville and that nice. whole occasion. You know, you talk about cases like Hellier and you talk about cases like the Kelly Hopkinsville case. One of the things that we hit on in Hellier 2 is uh, sort of a bit of a unification of paranormal origins as presented by George P. Hansen in his book, The Trickster and the Paranormal. Liminality is, is extremely important to all of these things that we're discussing, right? So the Hellier case All of the characters, as people watch, are all very liminal people. The Kelly Hopkinsville case, they were carnival employees. They lived very liminal lives in this house for a moment altogether. What are, not only that, those are cases of of aliens and high strangeness, but I also think that it dives into the ghost world as well. What are the most famous haunted places in the world? They're places like hospitals, prisons, mental asylums, hotels, train stations, places that people are only in for a short period of time and are constantly fluctuating in what's going on. So perhaps the Stanley Hotel being a liminal place with a lot of ghost stories helps further that even more. I think that completely makes sense. And we've posited similar theories ourselves, especially about hotels. And it's like you said, people are only there briefly, but for I think in a lot of cases too, for humanity anyway, when you're traveling or Doing something like that, whether it's in a plane or because we just did a story about a haunted airplane, <laughs> Eastern Flight 401. 401? Like whether, yeah, whether it's that or a hotel, which there's always things about hotels, you're in a kind of an unusual emotional state. You're not at that normal sort of at rest, safe feeling that you have when you're home or you're on the road. Everything is heightened. And if something happens to you during that time, it's even more of an exclamation point in your spiritual existence, I think, yeah. all of which 
And then people have talked about ley lines and, you know, roads that are traveled and that comes up with keel and every, yeah, you're right. It's all absolutely, just, it's so fascinating, but it's like so hard to like explain. <laughs> it is. There's something about your conscious brain normally being very settled and very solid. And when you shake that up, yeah, I think that it allows things that are on the periphery to poke through. Yeah. I think that sort of is is how I would sum up the way that I'm starting to think about this phenomenon. You know, thinking about it as a hotel, of course, what skeptics will say is, well, shoot, nobody can sleep as well in hotels. Sleep paralysis is more likely to occur. Right. Very true. But that doesn't explain how I was completely awake and, you know, saw the shadow figure and heard the giggle at the end of the hallway. Right. Yeah. There's something to it. Well, coming back to your talking about Greg and Dana. So after the podcast, you guys connected with them or Carl did. And and where did it go from there? Carl kept hitting Greg up thinking this is a really good story. It'd be really cool. He just wanted to go out and sort of have Greg tell the story. And then maybe we could do a little bit more of looking into trying to find David. Our idea was sort of to create a little YouTube series that could be sort of a paranormal catfish you know, Mm -hmm. which is interesting in in a couple of different ways. And we decided to go out to the town. When we went out to the town, we had all of these really bizarre synchronicities start to happen to us and then realized that this town is actually a place that's inundated with all sorts of weird paranormal reports. This entire area of the country is inundated with reports. And it became this entire high strangeness mythos story about Appalachia. And then that just evolved into the series, which it just kept ballooning into a bigger project. And Mm -hmm. then lo and behold, now you've just released a second season, which I imagine you've been working very hard on up until extremely recently. Right. (laughs) Up until extremely recently. We just finished it less than a month ago and it premiered four days ago. And yeah, honestly, you know, I'm knocking on wood. It's been doing, people are absolutely fascinated with the mystery, which is fantastic because I am too. And I hope that I'm able to give an ear where it's like, there's absolutely something going on here. The emails are something that haunted us for a long time. And in season one, we were kind of stumbling around. In season two, we try to be a lot more bookish and thoughtful about our methods. Sure, sure. Well, yeah, and for everybody who is interested in that, you can find it on Amazon. If you have Amazon Prime like I do, it's just there, which is beautiful. You can just watch it right out of the gate. Well, usually, yeah, there are connections. Scott and I have noticed this. We've certainly not been doing it as long as you folks have and don't do it as in depth. We cover something and then move on to the next thing. But there are usually connections when we look back on something that we didn't anticipate. So if you draw a line, and that that figures prominently in the episodes I'm watching now with Hilliard 2, if you draw a line through something, you'll find that connections do pop up. And I was wondering, what we see in Spirits of the Stanley in that series is an evolution and a really touching story about getting to know these spirits there and forming a communication and as sketchy and liminal as it is, forming a bond. But there was a comment where I believe in Hellier 2, where you say, oh, I I wonder if Eddie's here, or I wonder if somebody's dragged themselves along with us, and not in a bad way, but are maybe a part of this still. Have you realized any connection between your work and the evolution there of the techniques done at the Stanley Hotel and the development of the Estes Method and some of these other techniques that you use that you're now employing in Hellier 1 and 2? Is there any kind of connections that you've noticed? Yeah, absolutely. The basic Hellier format, and this isn't giving any spoilers, is that we'll spend, you know, for example, there's 10 episodes in this new season. We will spend a couple of episodes doing field work, going on the ground, interviewing people, doing the research and reading the books. And then we'll spend an episode doing an experiment. And part of that experiment is like, well, okay, we have this idea. We have these witnesses. We're in the right place. How can we if this thing is not going to just walk out and say hello, whether it's a cave goblin or an alien or a ghost, how can we get better in touch with them? Well, we're trying to induce some sort of psychical experiments sometimes. I mean, we're talking everything in Hellier, we're trying things like the Estes method, except even more extreme. We're going to tie in a Persinger Corin helmet with it. We're going to have somebody listen to a Frank's box and do the Estes method. We're going to try to change it up just to see what the phenomena contacts us through the best way. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's great. And that's definitely some of more that we want to talk about, too, as we get into how the Estes method developed. It's something else I did want to ask you about, too, because this is something I don't understand fully as a rookie paranormal investigator. We do a lot of research, but when it comes to paranormal investigation, we're super green. The flashlight system where you have, because we encountered this at the Sally House with other people that had done footage, and we've seen this footage of these flashlights turning on and off. How do you set that up? Do you need a particular type of flashlight? Because here's the thing that's interesting about this, too. Radiolab covered this a couple of years ago and did a story, a really heartwarming, touching story about this interaction with a, in a flashlight scenario. And then, of course, there was this huge backlash from, <laughs> from the intellectual NPR crowd, which I count myself among, by the way. I'm not putting them down. I'm just saying all these people send in these emails and you know, what are you doing ghost shows? This is Radio Lab. You're science oriented and that sort of thing. They got in a lot of trouble about it, which so then they released another show where they talked about that, which was pretty funny. But what I wanted to know was I seem to think when we were looking at that and that backlash to Radio Lab, there was discussion of, oh, the bulbs just heating up and cooling down and the contacts separating. You know, are you setting that up on purpose? Uh, because another thing that you guys did in Spirits of the Stanley was you talked about what seemed like a flashing light communication that was happening that you later ruled out because you decided that something was more in common with a a sort of ordinary mundane explanation in that particular case. How does that work with the flashlights and how do you set one up to make it easy for something to interact with it? And what exactly is going on when that happens? Sure. Mechanically. Yeah. What you're using there is a mag light, not a full on huge mag light. There are these things called mini mag lights Mm -hmm. um, that are probably about seven inch tall flashlights. You can get them at Walmart and get them target wherever. What you're doing is they, you twist the flashlight in order to get it to turn on. That connection is occurring between where the batteries are compartmentalized and where the actual flashlight and the bulb are up top. What you're doing is you're twisting it to a point where it is very close to being able to turn on. I mean, we're talking four or five full cycles to get this flashlight to turn all the way. So you're going to bring it up to four and a half. And you set it down on the ground. And the whole idea behind it, there's actual validity to flashlights and the way the circuitry works. And if the battery is too close to touching that bulb, it could heat up and cool down and cause that spark to happen for a moment and then go away. That's a very legitimate criticism, and and it's something that happens. The idea that we had behind it was realizing that that's the case, but what if we could have three, four, five flashlights? Of course, the theory is that it's just close enough that whatever spiritual energy that that ghost has, they can complete that circuit and give us a very clear visual representation, as opposed to a tiny little blip or a knock on a wall or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then when they step away, it stops. So we would do various controls to try and ask if flashlights were, if they were being interactive or not. And it was not as successful as other methods. Yeah. And what's your overall verdict on it? I mean, do you find it, when you say it's not as successful, do you find it a reliable method or do you feel like it's more of a distraction, maybe not effective? where, Where do you come down on it? Because, I mean, I saw in your own series reactions from these lights that were very specific Mm -hmm. Two questions that you asked and timed perfectly with what you said. I guess, too, though, subconsciously, you could get to a point where you know when it's going to heat up or cool down and you unknowingly ask the question and time it with it. Yeah, because it's like being an editor or whatever, and you accidentally do that perfect edit that you were trying to make right to the frame. I mean, what do you think about it overall? Do you think... And and how do you feel about that? I mean, do you look at some of these methods, having developed your own investigative method that is really getting out in the world now... Are there any that you look at and you go, what, that's bunk. That one's bunk. We're totally barking up the wrong tree here. This is fine if we're dragging a couple of tourists through a hotel basement, but I I only bring it along in case nothing else is actually happening so they'll feel like something happened. Well, here's the thing. It's very hard to, I don't use the method anymore or regularly. What I did is I got to know my flashlights. I think that that's something that's important for anybody to do with any sort of piece of equipment. So I practice in my home all the time. I don't know why there's this big old, like, don't ever investigate your house. Like, (laughs) to me, that's the equivalent of, like, playing in the NBA and only playing basketball in a championship round. Like, practice, practice, practice. And so we, (laughs) we would practice with our flashlights. I got to know how exactly I would like to set them 
However, there's validity to like if somebody stomps too close to it and could change that circuitry. I, that's not something that I can control. Yeah. But I had some pretty emotional moments from those flashlights. <laughs> yeah, sure. So it's an sure. internal battle. That said, I would recommend, um, I think I'm heading more into the let's play with the mind route as opposed to things happening physically outside of us. <laughs> Right. There's two things that I thought about the flashlight technique. Uh, one of them is that if it was naturally occurring expansion and contraction due to heat of the bulb or possibly the environmental conditions there, it would be more rhythmic. It wouldn't flicker because that leads into my second point that I initially had when Scott and I first talked about that story on Radio Lab about it is that there is a lot more context because that, to me, is the one main thing that gives it meaning. If you ask something like, what's your favorite color, and you get back the response, mayonnaise, that's meaningless. But if you ask a specific question, you get an answer to that question, and it makes sense, then that is context, and that's what the receiver of the message is looking for and what gives it meaning, because it is much like the story that was in Radio Lab, and that young man believed he was speaking to the spirits of his parents, and they were answering specific questions that only he would know and understand. And that's why he breaks down, because that delivered all the meaning. Was that happening most of the time for you folks, or would you say that most of the time it was inconclusive? With the flashlights, there was too many times that it was inconclusive. The moments that we only really liked were the very strong moments. It sort of became something like a motion sensor. Well, it's like, let's set it down. Let's not freak out if it goes off, but let's let it sit and do its thing. There were moments that I was able to act like a symphony conductor and point at this flashlight, this one, now this one, now all three at once. And it would happen on cue. Blows my mind how that could happen from just naturalized heating and cooling of these things. You could say, A, that's a ghost, or you could say, B, that's some sort of psychokinetic energy that I'm sending to the flashlights. Could go either yeah. way. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, there was another part in the series, Spirits of the Stanley, where, and it, it got kind of funny, where you guys were trying to get Eddie through the Estes method to figure out how many fingers one of your friends was holding up on his hand and then all these numbers started coming through and it seemed like Eddie was getting frustrated and just throwing numbers out. And even at one point, because the words you were saying that you were picking up sounded a little bit like he was irritated about trying to be made into like a sideshow with these numbers, like, all right, now you want numbers. What do you think was going on there? What do you think? And I thought this was really interesting too. And this is something you just said to me off the air, but like I had the same thought that you just said where what does this tell us about the experience that this person or, or spiritual being on the other side is having? Why is it so hard for them to see him holding up four fingers on his hand, but be able to communicate? What do, you, what do you think about that? It's a very shocking premise. Looking back on that session, the context, yeah, my friend Mark is sitting there holding up the number four on his hand. And he's holding this up. And just as a nice control question, while I was completely under the method for a long period of time, this was probably, you know, I had already been listening to the box for half an hour, 45 minutes. We don't do short sessions. When you go under, you go under for over an hour. And so wow. we're sitting there and I suddenly start hearing numbers over and over again. Three, 17, 30, 14, 9, 2, seemed like every number but four was coming across. He was growing frustrating with this. What I remember thinking in my own conscious brain was, I sure hope they just asked for a ghost phone number because all I can hear are numbers right now. Eddie was trying to figure out how many numbers were on his hand. But one of the other things that we heard come across that I heard come across the box was, you want numbers now. And then he just started listing out numbers. It seemed that he could not see us physically. He could only yeah. hear our voices. Or thoughts or mm. something. Or something. Yeah. Or it's, you know, yeah, my thought was it's a little bit of your friend being a smart aleck or a trickster, like, you know, giving you the wrong answer. It's, it's you go to get into the car and your friend pulls away 10 feet and you do it again. And he pulls away 10 feet and it's that joke. It's like, oh, you want some numbers? 17, 102, two, three, you know, it just, it's like, I'll play with you and I know what you're asking, but I might not give it to you. I might have a little fun with you here. 
But it also could be that he, whoever this spirit is, is trying their best because you hear that a lot too, trying, or uh, I'm attempting, you know, they seem to be attempting to work with you, but can't Yeah, they're having difficulty. There. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. It, there's a sort of spirit operation aspect to it. And, and you know, you look at it and that's one of the things that I hope gets out there more into the larger jargon of the paranormal is, is just being nice to ghosts. We have no idea how difficult this is for them. Right. They're putting forth a lot of effort to try to talk to us. And, and that's part of why I wanted to continue my research and why when we left the Stanley Hotel, I straight up asked the ghosts to come with me. I was like, I don't know if you're going to be talked to as much, but I want to keep talking with you. So come with us. We'll continue it. You just beautifully segued into my last question, which was about that. There was a couple of things about that because, yeah, as you were leaving, and this was after, you know, just to, for our listeners who haven't seen your web series, which, as we said, we'll have a link to it. But you, you guys were getting shut down, effectively. And one of the things you pointed out was how you always told them not to follow you home when you finished a session, which I think is a very wise policy when you're doing this kind of thing. But then on that last day, you were like, hey, you know, load up on the bus, and which I thought was, you know, being, and it's funny, when I started our series out, our listeners know this, but you might not, but I was wanting to experience something. And then after the experience that I had at the Sally House, my whole way of thinking about all of this stuff switched around, meaning that a few years ago, I might not have thought so much about what you said, but since then, I would be nervous to say, follow me home, because I'd be worried about the things that aren't talking to you, but also accept the invitation. So my question is, did anything follow you? Have you stayed in touch? Or have you been able to conjure any kind of interaction with Lucy or Paul or Eddie since then, and at, more importantly, off-site? We've had continuous visits from one particular ghost, and that's Eddie. He has appeared over and over throughout the last three or four years or so. We'll have, not every day, you know, two or three interactions every year that are very clearly Eddie stopping in. And I love it. I, I think it's fantastic. And the reason is, is because at that point, there was always this moral issue with what we did. Because what we were doing is I was being paid to take groups of tourists to go and try and experience these ghosts. I felt like I was a tour guide who was giving whale tours, but I was friends with the whales, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting here, and how do I balance that? And so there was, in a strange way, a sense of freedom of being like, I want to keep talking with you. Let's go. You're my friend. Let's go. And so Eddie has stopped by. In particular, when I started... Two years ago, I started dating uh, my girlfriend, and she started to notice things happening in her apartment within a couple of weeks of our first date. And she had not made the deep dive into what I'm really into and told me about these experiences. And it was crystal clear that Eddie had stopped by her place when I wasn't there. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Is he still carrying a smell with him? A bit of a smell from time to time, <laughs> mostly object interaction and a low voice. Ooh, party foul on both counts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's, oh, and that's one other thing that we didn't bring up, but one of the, I thought was a very compelling EVP was the one that Michelle Tate got in the bathroom, right? I, I don't remember which building you were in for that, but she was in the ladies' room mm -hmm. and got that recording, which you can clearly hear it say, leave. What, what do you yeah. want us to do? And it says, leave, right? And it sounds like a woman's yep. voice, too. That, I... Again, we don't know what anonymous spirits were stopping by. That was the train station of the Stanley Hotel. If you had to tie it to one, that could potentially be Lucy, who went to the women's bathroom as a place of privacy, uh -huh. which is odd, but could have been something that happened. That was every now and then you get the leave, the get out, things like that. More often you would get the hello, hi, things like that. So it's it's like any human friend interaction. Yeah. Sure. How did you meet up with Michelle? How did she become part of the group? And where did she go? Do you continue to interact with her with investigations? Yeah, Michelle's fantastic. She came up and really joined the hotel, joined our team as a dream job. You know, she was on a couple of seasons of the show Ghost Hunters. And most people will, will know her from that. She 
found out that Lisa, who had helped us out sometimes, was, was leaving and that we were still doing these investigations. I was like, yeah, Michelle, come on up. She became a regular member of the team. She was at the hotel for a little over a year. So not as long as Carl and I, but enough to really make it a good team unit. She has since, uh, she's living her life out in Texas and working a different job and doing things with still interested in the phenomena and, and different ghost stories and things like that, but not quite as, quite as publicly. Well, Connor, we want to thank you so much for coming on the show. We are looking forward to talking to you again next week about the Estes method and how it evolved and how it continues to evolve. So uh, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful to get to talk about some of the background. And now that everybody knows the background, let's get weird with some experiments. So we're going to come back to Lucy one more time for this EVP that Connor sent to us to include in the show. And I've got to personally say this EVP, you honestly, you probably couldn't write a scarier little phrase <laughs> to be coming from the ghost of a little girl in a 110-year-old hotel. I'm going to read their description of it right now. Caught by a recorder placed up in the main concert hall proper while all five investigators present were downstairs. You'll hear us talking in the background, but then it sounds like a child's voice says, come out and play over our conversation. I didn't know what to expect when I first played this in my headphones after Connor sent it, but it was one mm. of those ones where I had to take the headphones off and walk away for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I saw him do it. Too. Yeah. yeah. So we're just going to play this for you now. We're going to, as we did with the other clips, we're going to play it twice. The first time exactly as it was sent to us, which it's kind of low and there's a lot of background noise. And then the second time a little bit cleaned up through uh, mixing tricks in uh, Pro Tools that we use to work with. So get ready for Lucy making her best appearance in an EVP at the Stanley Hotel. That to me is just chilling and it's not chilling Mm. in the same way that file 10 at the sally house is chilling right it's chilling in the all the other things that make it spooky a little girl and also the talking this is what was surprising to me about it and i certainly don't know much about this but the way that she's saying the phrase almost sounds to me like it has the cadence of somebody that lived a long time ago like it has Mm. a certain sort of dialect and delivery and intonation to it that for lack of a better word, yeah. feels kind of old timey to me. Interesting, you know. Interesting. Come out yeah. and play. It's like yeah. it's come out and play. Like which today a kid might be like, come out and play. You know, just like it seems <laughs> almost formal. You know, right, right. And that to me seems like something you would hear from the ghost of a child that maybe lived in the early 1900s or certainly before these days. Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, I don't think that they had any solid reference to when Lucy was around. Of course, there is that legend that she was around, I think, in the 70s and and lived as a homeless teen. But yeah, but Connor chased that down and they couldn't find anything, right? So right, right. Then we are getting into that whole thing he was talking about that's almost like Tulpa territory, or maybe you just don't know what you're talking to. No, but it's clear that this is a voice and not static and not somebody who would be an adult talking to them, saying that phrase that ends up on tape. And it's pretty clear. It's a pretty good one. It's one of the best I've heard. Well, whatever it is, it clearly knows that when you're there, you're expecting to hear a little girl. All right. Well, special thanks again to Connor Randall for coming on and talking to us, uh, spending so much of his time with us. Very gracious for that. Uh, You can follow Connor on Twitter at Connor J. Randall. That's C-O-N-N-O-R. J, and then Randall, R-A-N-D-A-L-L, if you want to follow him there. If you're interested in seeing Hellier, you can visit hellier.tv, and that's Hellier, H-E-L-L-I-E-R. That has all the information on how to watch or donate there to their cause to help them continue documenting their fascinating story. I got to say, Forrest, I just immensely enjoyed that interview. I want to thank him again for coming on. I really actually want to go to the Stanley now. Mm -hmm. So maybe you and I can do that if we're lucky in 2020. 
I, there's a good chance I'm going to be in Denver anyway to visit my dad. So I know, oh, right? Yeah, I think it would be cool to go take the DR60, take the SB7, take the Connect SLS, and uh, yeah, we got all kinds of toys and gear and instruments now to see what we can get. But we got to get out with them in some capacity at some time. Yeah, and I can't think of a better place to start off. We already know some of the residents. Of course, who knows if they'd come out for us? They'd probably be like, "Who are these bozos?" <laughs> well, somebody comes out for you, so apparently. <laughs> uh, maybe just that one location, but yeah, you never know. I, I think that's the case here is that it's, it is very unpredictable and, and that ruffles a lot of people's sense of reason when in investigating ghosts or trying to get evidence or as they would want proof, but it doesn't happen that way. But occasionally you'll get some snippets that really make you think. And I think that's what we have here. Well, I'll just say one last thing here and that my expectations, I believe, were changed a little in that I think like a lot of us, you associate the Stanley Hotel with the movie The Shining. And it's probably got some dark and demented history that made it so haunted and something bad happened there and continued to, and and that's what's trapped at the place. But it doesn't seem to be the case with The Stanley. It had a very mild and nice and peaceful start to its long life and continues to. But it's like that quote that we said at the beginning. And I believe that that comes from the novel The Shining in that Stephen King wrote, as we said in the beginning, any big hotels have got scandals, just like every big hotel has got a ghost. Why? Because, you know, people come and go. And I think it goes on to further say sometimes one of them will pop off in his room, heart attack or stroke or something like that. Hotels are superstitious places. That kind of sums it up in that it's like any other place that's been around for a long time or a place that was just built. You don't really know what's going to be residing there. And in this case, Furthered on by Stephen King's novel and Stanley Kubrick's movie, we all have this idea that it's got to be really haunted because, yeah, something terrible happened there. It's got some deep, dark secrets, but it doesn't have to be the case. I think here, just as that passage would suggest, it's just like any other place, and it has souls coming in and out, both alive and dead. Well, next week, we're going to get into the nitty gritty with Connor on the Estes method. You're not going to want to miss that one. But with regard to the Stanley Hotel, I think the bottom line is this. No matter what you believe about ghosts, spirits, and visits from the other side, it makes sense that some places in this world are better locations to run into them than others. And it sounds to me like the Stanley Hotel is at the top of that list. You know, when we used to have people sign up for the tours, there would be a group of 20 or so people. And we got to a point where we had done this so many hundreds of times that we could, while we're checking people in and we say, okay, here's your tickets. We're going to be out until two in the morning, bring a coat. We would have brief interactions with people. If there was a person who was not into it, clearly was dragged along, did not want to be there. Carl and Shell and I used to be able to look at each other and say, well, nothing's going to happen tonight because that person would, (laughs) would dampen the vibe. I don't know if it's an energy thing. I don't know if it's just a, a communicative tool that they need for their end of the telephone, but the spirits would either choose not to or not be able to come through during that kind of energy. You have to be into it. You have to be excited about it. You have to be awake. I mean, whether or not Ghost Adventures is half real or not, we could debate all day, but they're excited about it. They certainly right. seem to get a lot of stuff. But the people in, in my even personal experience, when you're into it, the ghosts will be into it too. That's going to wrap up tonight's episode on the Stanley Hotel. Special thanks to Connor J. Randall, who returns next week to talk in depth about the development of the Estes Method, an intriguing new paranormal investigation technique that he and Carl Pfeiffer developed while working at the Stanley. Please remember to support our sponsors. They help keep the show free and the lights on in Blanket Fortiana. Special thanks to John Bolin. Hi, I'm Bronwyn. V-E. A-M. To use my voice however they see fit. Galaxy-wide in perpetuity. And when I'm not going to bed with all of the lights and the TV on. Our show is edited by Sarah Voorhees Wendell and co-produced by Tess Feifel, who is also our head of research. Our theme, which is available as a ringtone, was composed by Judson Crane, and our sound design and additional composing is by Ryan McCullough. Special thanks to the Astonishing Research Corps. 
But most importantly, we want to thank you, our listeners. Visit our store at astonishinglegends.com or interact with us and other listeners on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can also support the show at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends, where patrons have access to additional bonus content. No part of this show may be reproduced anywhere without permission. Copyright Astonishing Legends Productions. Good night. Thank you.